John Kafalas is currently a Larimer County Commissioner, elected to his second term in 2022, and previously served many years as a Colorado State Representative and later State Senator. He previously worked in education, advocacy, and outreach with special emphasis on career development, housing, and serving the underserved and marginalized. He got his botany degree from Colorado State University, a master's in teaching certificate from Fairleigh Dickinson University, and has continued a life of service to cause that is an inspiration to many. John has a reputation for being one of the most progressive political figures in Northern Colorado, and we spent a lot of time in this episode pulling back the curtain on how things really worked behind the scenes in government and respectfully challenging one another's ideas of how they should work. This Get to Know episode goes beyond most you'll find and includes a dramatic segment where John shares his challenges faced as a man of short stature. So please enjoy, and thanks for tuning in to my conversation with Larimer County Commissioner John Kapalas. Let's have some fun. Welcome to the Loco Experience Podcast. On this show, you'll get to know business and community leaders from all around Northern Colorado and beyond. Our guests share their stories, business stories, life stories, stories of triumph and of tragedy, and through it all, you'll be inspired and entertained. These conversations are real and raw, and no topics are off limits. So pop in a breath mint and get ready to meet our latest guest. Welcome back to the Loco Experience Podcast. I'm honored today to be joined by Larimer County Commissioner John Kafalis and a longtime uh, public servant here in northern Colorado. And so, John, thank you for making time to be here. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, Kurt, and I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. So um, I think the obvious first question is, is what do county commissioners do anyway? <laughs> and I know you can't kind of summarize well, it all, but... Well, yeah, that's that's an important question, and a lot of times folks don't know. But to answer your question, so there are three county commissioners, Larimer County commissioners. In Colorado, there are 64 counties. Okay. Um, the, the ones that m- most populated, of course, along the front range. Right. So 64 counties. Most of the counties have three commissioners. There are some that have five commissioners. Mm. But in terms of what we do, we do a variety of things. It's kind of interesting. I've learned since being a commissioner and I just started my second term. Well, one thing that's important for folks to know is that we are elected at large. So even though you have to live in a particular district, there are three districts, three commissioners. So, for example, I live in District 1, which is in the northern one-third of the county. So from Drake Road in town in Fort Collins all the way up to the Wyoming border, all the way west to Jackson <laughs> County, or gotcha. Ca- you know Cameron Pass, yep. and then all the way east out up to Weld County. So you have to live in the district, but when you're up for election or perhaps re-election, then it's at large. So the whole county votes. Exactly. Oh, that's fascinating. So that's how it works. In terms of what we do, I mean, we, we dabble in all three branches of government, and I think that's important for folks to understand. So we, the executive branch, of course, at the state level, will be the governor and all that. Sure. But we serve as, um, as the executive branch because we oversee the county mm. budget. Almost like the governor's arm in right. this county. Yeah. In yeah. In some ways. It, it, absolutely. So we oversee the budget of the various departments and service service areas, and then we also serve in the legislative branch because we deal with policy issues, mm. and then finally we serve in the judicial or quasi judicial realm because when we have land use hearings. Then we're mm. supposed to, um, you know, not have what's called ex parte communication. In other words, like a judge, we have to stay focused on the hearing and all the information that's received. So we dabble in all three branches of government. We oversee the budget. Uh, we work on policy like affordable housing, child care, you know, the bread and butter issues that are facing a lot of us. And uh, we also make land use decisions. Mm. We update our land use code and so forth. Are you an, on the executive side? Does like the the regulatory obligation of business and industry come through your office too in a in a sort of fashion? Uh, yes, and and that's you know the <clears throat> regulatory like side. liquor licenses and different things. Yes, like that. so liquor licenses, you know, they they um, once they've been approved initially, then typically it's a consent agenda item mm. where an entity, a business, wants to renew their liquor license unless there are some issues. But initially, when they want to apply for a liquor license, they actually we have a hearing. 
uh, and, and the applicants come to us, we have our, our attorney there, and we go through a pretty formal process. And generally, we approve folks if they've met all the criteria from the state. Hmm. So yes, we do oversee things like that. And then when it comes to uh, land use code and building code, uh, you know, ultimately, if those things come to the commissioners for a hearing, we make decisions mm. on that as well. And that certainly can impact uh, businesses. And I can give you, you know, lots of examples. I'm but. sure. Well, I just, uh, we're kind of getting into current events with this question, but I just huh. saw that Los Angeles city or county banned all oil production inside the county. And I was shocked at how much oil production there actually was. There's lots of old grasshoppers still steadily pumping away over there. Um, would that be a county level thing? Is it county of Los Angeles in that kind of space? Good question, Kurt. Very good question. And so the legislature back in 2019 passed a bill, Senate Bill 19-181 in the state Senate. And essentially what that bill did, among other things, is it gave local jurisdictions, counties, much more authority, you know, to create their own local or countywide uh, oil mm. and gas regulations. Yeah. So since that occurred prior to that, we didn't really have any oil and gas regulations in Larimer County. So to your question, we do now. We've gone through a process mm. over the last couple of years. And we do have granted rights in that space. Of yes, sorts. but we have within our land use code, which is the regulatory authority that we have. Um, uh, there is a there is a section in there that deals with oil and gas development. Mm. And so, if there's a, a a business or an operator that wishes to uh, do an, a new oil and gas development, they have to go through the county process, submit an application, and ultimately, if they're to be approved, there are a lot of review criteria and all of that. So, yeah, that's an example of uh, the county's involvement in, in regulations that were updated since 2019, and they are in place. For example, like what's happening right now, you speak of current events, uh, one of the proposed oil and gas developments that is being considered in the town on the east side of Loveland, okay. uh, um, west of I-25, the McWinnies, mm -hmm. uh, they have a proposal for an oil and gas development. Mm. But because that is in the town limits of Loveland, we don't have... Uh, direct say over that. Oh. And, and right now, Loveland doesn't really have, I think they're developing their oil and gas regs. So they're kind of I in see. the middle of all that. Yeah, yeah. I hope that that responds to your question. No, I think so. I think so. Uh, another thing I was thinking about as far as current events is the the carriage house and the accessory dwelling units and stuff that was here in, in local Number County. When you say land use, that's kind of the big picture stuff. But it seem, seems like that was a city of Fort Collins thing more than it was a county. Yeah, yes. And, and all... All good observations and all good questions. So the county's jurisdiction primarily is in the unincorporated parts of the county. Gotcha. So where there's a, what's called a GMA, a growth management area, mm -hmm. you know, around, you know, for example, around the city of Fort Collins, that's why, where there has to be a lot more cooperation, mm. partnership on a variety of yeah. issues, including land use issues. So the, the whole um, discussion, debate regarding the uh, the city of Fort Collins land use code or land development code as they attempted to change it, that was really a local issue. Um, our land use code specifically applies to uh, land use decisions within the unincorporated area. Yeah, yeah. If there's um, a proposal that's within the growth management area, like whether it's Timnith or Wellington right. or the city of Fort Collins, then there has to be... If uh, we're going to grow into this space, yeah. we don't want you to be... Right. Like so, I'm thinking about East Mulberry now that will be part of the city of Fort Collins eventually, but Larimer County shouldn't necessarily approve buildings and structures and stuff that aren't, that are way far away from what the city is going to want to have when they get that property annexed. Absolutely. And so right <clears throat> now, the East Mulberry Corridor is a lot of discussion about, you know, perhaps in phases annexing that property. I mean, right now, if you look at the map, it's kind of a, a puzzle, you know, a puzzle where, <laughs> yeah. you know, some parts are in, in the county, uh, and, and then, of course, some parts are already within the city limits. But I think the long-term goal is for everything out to, um, you know, to I-25 and on the west side of I-25 will be annexed into the mm. city of Fort Collins. And what does that mean? It means a lot of things. It a means lot of that, new sidewalks out there. Well, new sidewalks, you know, <laughs> the, there'll be a shift, although there'll have to be cooperation on on public safety or law enforcement issues. Right. Because right now— Oh, sheriff patrols you know, it out there yeah, now. I mean, the, exactly. I mean, spot on. 
and uh, and and so the the Fort Collins Police Services would take over those responsibilities. But of course, there always has to be collaboration and right. and all of that. And and even of course, I'm sure one of the uh, issues that people are thinking about is if you're in the city, then you're paying the city sales tax. If right. you're in the county, you're not paying the city sales yeah, tax. Yeah. When I got engaged years ago, I used <laughs> to live down in. Uh, Greenview Court, I think, or something like that, South Fort Collins, and that was a little pocket of county. And the lady was like, "Here, let me help you out. I'll, I'll deliver this to you and save you two hundred bucks on your engagement rings tax, or maybe not that much, but something significant." But, and yeah. you know, good good for her to be observational of that, I guess. Yes, and you're bringing up a lot of really important stuff, and and there's definitely a lot of interplay, or inter, you know, intersection between what the the municipalities do. There are eight municipalities, either wholly or in part, within Larimer County. I think currently the population of Larimer County is about 370,000 folks. Mm-hmm. And I think a little around 50% of those folks are in the city of Fort Collins. Right, right. And indeed, that's part of the county. But again, the city has the direct jurisdiction over land use stuff within the city, you know, and a variety of other things. In the growth management area, we got to work together for sure. So I want to go a little bit more macro right away with um, there's 54 counties and there's county commissioners at all. Do, is there a connection between all those counties that are outside of like the governor's office or things like that? I mean, do you have your own little secret meetings off to the side, or, uh, or how does that work? Well, if, if I may, um, um, in terms of the number of counties within the state of Colorado, <clears throat> it's actually 64. 64, 64 I'm sorry. 64 counties. And it's interesting because, for example, you've got um, – and I will get to your question. I, That's fine. <laughs> I, sometimes I digress. I chase I? squirrels. I'm a world-class squirrel but chaser. But you, you got to bring me back. you got to bring me I back. I will. That's my job. Of course. But um, <laughs> just as an example, so Larimer County is, you know, is one of the fastest-growing counties, and we know all the implications of that. We can get into that if you'd like. And we have about 370,000 folks. Uh, and then you to the west is Jackson County. Right. Jackson County has about fifteen hundred folks. Right. And so, nine hundred of them are in Walden. Well, nine hundred of them <laughs> or are in Walden. Or something like that, right? Um, but so sixty four counties. And to your question, there is um, nothing is in secret, you know, uh, other than executive sessions and things of that nature. You know, all the meetings that the county does, the other counties do, you know, have to be in a public setting, you know, for all the reasons. Hmm. But there is a, there are two statewide associations. Uh, that actually represent the interests of the counties, uh, primarily at the uh, state level in the legislature. Mm. And you know, right now the legislature is in session; it's it's fast and furious. So there is something called CCI or Colorado Counties Inc., and that's a statewide association. Okay. You know, like most entities, they have you know the city of Fort Collins, for example, has the color is part of the Colorado Municipal League. The counties, most of them, are part of Colorado Counties, Inc., CCI, and they they have lobbyists, they have staff, we pay dues, et cetera, but ultimately they represent the interests of uh, the counties with regard to legislation that's being introduced and that could be, become law. There's also another statewide group that's newer in the last five or six years uh, that's called, the, the acronym is CCAT, uh, C-C-A-T, and that stands for Commission... Counties and commissioners acting together, so hmm. two statewide organizations, and they primarily represent you know the our interest at the state level with regard to legislation and all of that. Well, and like, who are the enemies of the counties in, in terms of represent? Who are you pushing against? Is it cities like being kind of too big for their britches kind of thing and thinking they can push you guys around, or? Is it the state that's trying to make you do things that they don't give you any money to try to accomplish? Like, what are those kind of friction points that you're advocating for? I I would submit that it's all of that. But for example, when you um, you cited the state re- trying to make us do things or requiring unfunded mandates, yeah, that, everybody that's likes the unfunded term that, mandates. Yeah, and and there's that, and so that's that's or funded mandates, right? Well, those are better. But but even there, you know, one of the things that I'm learning through the lens of county commissioner, because as you know, and perhaps some of your, the listeners know, I served 12 years in the state legislature, yeah. in the House and in the Senate. So you have various lenses. Now I have a county commissioner lens and things like unfunded mandates, uh, issues like um, local control, yeah. those resonate a lot. And so oftentimes there are well-meaning bills that are um, undermining local control, mm. and, and that's that's an example of a serious friction point. I mm. mean, and yeah, let yeah. me put some words into your mouth because okay. I've heard you talk before. Oh dear! And say basically that 
<laughs> you know, my beliefs don't necessarily align here, but the people that I represent, the people in my district believe this way. And so that's why I'm supporting this thing. And so what I, I'm jumping ahead, but I think what I hear you saying is now my job is county commissioner. I'm here to represent local control and local interests for my district and my people. And so my job in some ways is quite a bit different than when I was in the the state with representatives thing. That was a different role. Yes, and I would say that's an accurate um, assessment or observation. And, and uh, you know, any person who's elected to public office, uh, you know, you have, um, you, you win by a certain majority, and then some people think, well, then you only represent the interests of the people who voted for you. Yeah. You know, sometimes I'll have co- folks come up to me and they're asking me for something, you know, and it's appropriate and all of that. It, um, uh, and they'll say, well, and I voted for you. And, and I like to remind <laughs> folks that... I hope you can believe this. It doesn't matter. I mean, ultimately, we get elected. We get elected by a majority. Not everyone votes for you. But in the end, if you're going to be um, an authentic uh, public servant, elected person, you got to try to represent the interests of everyone. Yeah. And that's not easy. You know, there's you, know, you, you try to find some middle ground. You try to find some compromise. But in the end, certainly as a county commissioner, I want to represent the interests of folks, you know, at the state level because there are all these bills that that even though they might have good intentions, there, yeah. there's there's tons of uh, you know, we <laughs> you're call, kind of a student of unintended consequences. Well, as well. yes, yes, and and <laughs> I, and I, when I was in the legislature, I, I tried really hard. Sometimes you can't prevent it a hundred percent, but you, if you're a good policymaker, whether at the county level or at the state level, or certainly at the federal level, you what is the problem <coughs> you're trying to solve, um, and and is there a role for government, and yeah. are are you addressing, are you considering any potential unintended consequences. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Um, I think we can talk a lot more about evolution of thought and and philosophies and things like that, but it might actually be grounding to jump in the time machine and go back to young John third grade or wherever. Where'd you come from? Are you Northern Colorado native? Uh, the old time machine, eh? Yeah, um, we have one here. Back, <laughs> back, back, back to the future. Um, so, uh, Thank you, and I appreciate this is a this is a fun conversation that we're having, and I hope it's informative for folks. But so basically, I I'm not a Colorado native. Um, I actually grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Oh wow! I was born um, in in Piraeus, Greece. Oh wow! Uh, um, you know, my family's first generation. It's a long story. You don't need to necessarily hear about why I was born there. But ultimately, I grew up most of my, you know, growing up years were in, in, in Brooklyn, New York. I'd like to hear the 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 short story, the Cliff Notes version, at least. My wife and I have traveled Greece. Uh, really? where, where is Pieros? Well, so if you have ever taken the ferries. And I'm one-eighth Greek, by the way. Really? Uh, Interesting. One of my grandfather, great-grandfathers was adopted through Lutheran Social Services as an orphan. Interesting. Yeah. Well, so my parents, first-generation Greek immigrants, my father came over in the 30s. They're um from an, we're from an island that's called Hios, which is very close to Turkey. It's um yeah. about ten miles away. It's in the northeastern part of the Aegean. It's a really amazing. I've been place. to Ephesus. Oh yes, I, I <laughs> so it's actually, pretty close to there. I reckon. Abs- you're spot on. Yes, um, Samos is closer to Ephesus, but we're just north there. Yeah, um, yeah. but very close to the Turkish. <laughs> Those neighbor. rugs in the lobby, uh, the one in the bathroom <laughs> and the one in the in the lobby, are from a Turkish. An, a, a rug maker and my wife and I, when we went there the first time, bought one. And then he runs around the country once every five years or something selling rugs. And he always calls when he's coming through town. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Oh, that's. Gosh. I want to hear about your family coming here in the 30s. No. Was that like strife in Greece that no, my, led my, to that? Or? You know, like a lot of you know folks in those days, they come for more economic opportunity yeah. and all yeah. that. So my father came over. He was um, he ba- barely had, <coughs> excuse me, a high school diploma. And ultimately, he got his U.S. citizenship by serving four years in World War II. Mm. So he served in World War II. Uh, most of his life, he didn't have a whole, you know, college education. I was the, uh, you know, I was the first one to go to college and graduate. Mm-hmm. I have two siblings. I'm the oldest, and so on. So he worked mostly in the diners. Yeah, uh, yeah. If, if You know what diners are. Sure. And, and in the restaurant business, and and um, and then he met my mother. They got married. 
and then she decided to go back to the old country, oh. and that's why I was born there. Okay. Otherwise, I should have been born in Brooklyn. Are and you a dual citizen? I was a dual citizen for the longest time, but yeah. I and I'm a naturalized citizen, but you know, U.S. citizen, of course. So that's why I was born there. But I have a lot of connections there, a lot of family. Yeah. My younger, my younger sister. <clears throat> She married a Greek fellow, and they live in Athens, for example. Okay. Um, so is your mother, was she from Greece, too? Yeah. Yep, she they, was. They, okay. Yeah, we're about as Greek as they come. Yeah, yeah. And if you've ever watched the movie uh, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, sure. what I often tell folks that uh, 98% of that is accurate, and I can relate <laughs> and to all that. And that's my family that looks like my my mom's aunt. <laughs> I, had a, I had a yaya, I had a grandmother like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so on. So a lot of connections with Greece, and and that's part of my heritage. Yeah. And and that you know that's part of my journey. Um, and I try to go back periodically when I can to visit. Very cool. And and to go to the island of Chios. So, uh, for yes. what it's worth, uh, huh. very early in my career, Spiro Palmer was one of the most encouraging men in my world. Like in my second or third year of banking, he yep. kind of took a shine to me and really encouraged me to become wise and he would just always talk about smart things and i know his boys and stuff like that too still yeah and he's a good friend in his family and then of course uh you must know uh the owner of tony's and the whiskey uh tony Catopoli. i don't but he should be a guest yeah. on the podcast you, you one of these about days that. so yeah. his wife angela passed away a number about five years ago and okay. he's still struggling with that but his his son owns i think you know tony's Bar and then I go to the whis- whiskey once in a while. Yeah, I, I Tony's need, I used to, I but to, I'm a little, <laughs> need, I'm a little responsible for that now. <laughs> I need to go to there, but I haven't yet. Uh, nevertheless, they're they're good people, and and they have a, a good history here, and you know they've been contributing members in so many ways. Spiro oh, yeah. Palmer, oh, huge. Uh, with his, you know, and how he's built. Um, you know, he's been a very successful business person, for sure. and he's always given back to the community. And I would, I would offer that that's a key component to being a successful business person. Yeah, is giving back. You yeah, know. is that specifically Greek culture too, or is that more of an American thing? Is there as much uh, kind of charity and giving back? Because we always hear America is the most charitable country. Um, uh, yeah. Well, I would say that for me, a lot of that is coming from my father. Mm. Uh, he he passed away. Um, he was pretty young because he smoked cigarettes for the longest time, and that didn't help. Uh, but he passed away in 1982, and when he was, mm. I think, 67. Wow. Yeah. But you know what? What he left with me is he didn't have much, but he would always put others <laughs> ahead of him. Yeah, yeah. And I think that you know that um, that really stuck with me. Although I'll I'll never forget. I went back to after I came back from the Peace Corps, and that's an important part of my journey. Um, I decided to pursue my master's degree closer to New York so that I could spend time with mm. him because I sort of had a feeling he wasn't going to be around much longer. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I remember that we really made a lot of connections about some yeah. of the, the advocacy and the work that I was doing, over, and since especially since coming back from yeah. my experiences in the Peace Corps. You probably had your eyes open quite a bit by that time. I had and... my eyes open oh, quite a bit. And one of the things that left me with my dad, my father, was that he would always say, yeah, I get it why you want to try to make the world better and things of that nature. But he said, before you do that, you have to have your, you're like this, you have to have your own pot to piss in. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I've been accused of, oh. of uh, I have a phrase I've shared for years, um, ask of your needs and share of your abundance. Oh. And uh, been scolded a few times of like, hey, you need to actually build some abundance before you can share it. Like you're trying so hard to, to give that you need to actually get your own pot to piss in first <laughs> great and so. i think i think there's a lot of uh, value and truth to that absolutely yeah, yeah. And, and you you can also tell that i'm greek or mediterranean because i use my hands a lot yeah you're hitting and the I, microphone I, and stuff <laughs> i'll have to try to control that as i'm gonna have to pour you that whiskey so that you have something to do with your hand perhaps um, <laughs> um so i want to before we like leave new york and go to master's school and peace corps and stuff i want to hear about you as a young man, how many? You said you had two siblings as well. Yeah, so I have my my um, both of them are younger. My sister and my brother. There were three of us, yep. and and we grew up in New York. And um, kind of a uh, was it like a Greek neighborhood even where you actually, had a lot of that, or it, is it all mixed? And it, there's it's Puerto t- Ricans over here, and Mexicans over there, and whatever. You're good. I guess you've been around the block a few times, I suppose. You know, I watch TV, I have Netflix. But, but you know. know, it's interesting that um, you know it was a very eth- well. I want to say ethnically diverse neighborhood, but back in, in when we were growing up, uh, there was a strong Greek community. There were various Greek Orthodox churches. Mm-hmm. You know, in terms of, you know how it is in, I think you know how it is in, in, in big cities. 
you know, there, there are waves of yeah. the different... Yeah, the ethnic, Irish came at this yeah, time, and, and then and the so, Greeks came at this time. You know, there was a time when it was Scandinavian, Norwegian, Greeks, um, others, you know, and all of them were the European yeah. uh, immigrant uh, pop- population. The Mediterranean stayed away from North Dakota, where I grew up, because oh. they were like, it's cold over there. <laughs> although, <laughs> but the Norwegians although, and stuff settled although, more. Although, <laughs> Although there is a um, somewhat vibrant um, uh, Greek community, for example, out in Meeker. Oh, is that right? Because Greeks migrated to Y, and there's even a really amazing Greek Orthodox church up in Cheyenne, really? which you would never think. But I, my understanding is that a lot of Greeks or or many families migrated out here for sheep to uh, to mm. raise sheep and yeah, to do ranching yeah. and that kind of work. That makes sense. So yeah. So, like, we're here in New York, and New York's kind of busy, kind of lame, nothing like any part of Greece, really, and they got sheep country out there. Yep. But, no, very diverse. Uh, You know, I grew up, I know what delicatessens are. You walk up to the avenue, you go to the fish store to buy the fish, you go to the vegetable store to buy the vegetables. And then over time, a lot of those stores were, um, uh, you know, more people from the Middle East, you know, moved into the neighborhoods. Uh, certainly, people from Asia. So it's changed a lot as 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 things are over the years. And then you know you mentioned um, um, uh, uh, you know different um, uh, ethnic groups like Puerto Rican and so forth. I remember growing up and and there was some you know some ethnic or racial strife that there was a dividing line. We lived on mm. where we grew up. We were lucky. The first couple of years we lived in an apartment building, but then my my father was able to buy this house mm. on, on a corner lot, like an old, just an amazing house. And we lived on what was called 68th Street and then 2nd Avenue or Ridge Boulevard. But 65th Street was always considered the, quote, dividing line. Mm. And below that, where where, where um, uh, Puerto Rican folks lived. And mm. and that was an, always an interesting tension or dynamic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there was some of that growing up. But overall, it was an amazing experience. Um, I, I, you Were know, you my, a good student, an athlete, any of those things? Uh, I, I liked, uh, you know, I was like a lot of kids growing up in the in the city. I liked playing basketball. I know that might be a little surprising. Yeah, you didn't have a career in the NBA. In, in no, the although I, I had some friends who I went to um, a junior high school with that ultimately went into the NBA. Oh, cool. Yeah, so I, I, I enjoyed sports. I was never much of an athlete. I was good academically. Um, you know, certain things were of, of interest to me. And, you know, I remember, because there, you know, we have a bus system. So you would take the bus to go to, uh, you know, I, I went to William yeah. McKinley Junior High School, Port yeah. Hamilton High School, uh, and, and so uh, public school, PS 102. So I have a lot of memories of all that. And, and again, growing up in the city or a place like New York is, is different. Um, I'm feeling like you're a really curious guy and wanted to learn a lot. And, like, I was that close from signing up for Peace Corps when I was leaving high school because I was so curious about the rest of the world, but I grew up in such a very rural environment. Where, where and, was and, that now? Uh, Central North Dakota. That's what you were... Uh, near Jamestown is where I grew up, and so graduated the class of five, really didn't have any exposure. I was scared to death when I went to North Dakota State University because I'd never barely been to big towns, wow. you know? Wow. And so a lot of contrast, but a lot of curiosity, and so... Uh, I suspect that we might have some similar wiring in that space. Uh, yes, and, and, and maybe to fast forward a tiny bit. So I graduated from high school in 1972. Okay. And within the Greek culture, like within a lot of cultures, you don't ask questions. You, you either you know find a good job or you go to college. Right. And so I wound up going to City College of New York for a year and a half. Okay. And um, uh, not really sure why. But I, yeah. I did well, but I, I, again, it wasn't really... Uh, well, if you're not really sure why, it's hard yeah, to exactly. do well. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it, it turns out I went for a year and a half, you know, b- beyond high school. And then I, um, uh, friends, um, and it explains why I'm out here in Colorado now for 45 plus years. So I took a, a semester off from college, CCNY, and I wound up working in a uh, fast food place. Um, oh. And so that was an interesting experience. Uh, I was in the... the um, the, the French fries department. And, I, you know, that was back then it was a chain, but it was very different than all the chains, you know. And I remember working with a bunch of old Greek guys, you know, doing oh, fast food. Was it food. a Euros fast food? Kind no, of it was, it was a re, you know, it was okay. regular hamburgers yeah. and all the rest. So I did that. I saved up money. And then uh, three friends and I and a little dog, we, um, we took a trip out west. And we went oh. to Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado to see the Rocky Mountains because yeah. we really didn't know much about that. Sure. And I fell in love with the you know the Rocky Mountains, and um, there were a lot of adventures there. And, and I remember we were coming out of the Tetons, the Grand Tetons sure. up in Wyoming. Yeah. We, we had just uh, we were completing a, 
a few day backpack trip and we met we met up with a a ranger a backcountry ranger and I think we might have gotten ticketed because back this was <laughs> you weren't a, supposed to be there. <laughs> well, we had the dog with us. Oh right, and you know how. The, yeah, and yeah. That was back in 1974. But we're coming out, and he says to us um, after he noticed the dog, little puppy, and all that, "Have you heard the news?" I said, "No, we've been, um, you know, we've been in the backcountry for the last few days." Yeah. And it turns out that was August of 74, right around the time that uh, Richard Nixon uh, resigned. Oh. So that was really interesting. Interesting, yeah. But, That's when I was born, actually, was August of 74. Really? <laughs> huh. Uh-huh. But long story short. I don't remember anything about the Nixon stuff being a big deal at the time. Well, it, Anyway, yeah. keep going, please. No, just long story short, uh, I mean, I fell in love with the Rocky Mountains, and it actually motivated me, inspired me to go back and and do better in school mm. and and I I determined that I wanted to be a forest ranger why mm. not yeah and and so I I went back and I attended a, a community college actually and I did well and I got my GPA and I took all the you know all all the coursework that I think really interested me yeah and then it was time to apply to schools and I actually applied to um various schools but the two that I was accepted to with one was the University of Montana in Missoula, oh, yeah. and the other one was Fort Lewis College in Durango, mm. and and so I decided to go to um, Fort Lewis College in Durango, oh, wow. and I was there for a year, and that was an amazing experience, um, and then ultimately after a year I transferred up to CSU Colorado yeah. State University, and I started I completed my bachelor's degree Bachelor of Science in Botany at CSU, nineteen seventy six to nineteen seventy eight. Mm. So I've I've um. Do you know Phil Murphy? Phil Murphy's in my Rotary Club, and I think he oh he might have got his education in Alaska, but he served a long time as a forest ranger out is that, here. Is that right? Yeah. Which Rotary Club is uh, that? The Breakfast Rotary Club, okay. Thursday mornings at Ginger and Baker at 7 a.m., oh, I, I if don't, you're I, interested. I, I, yeah, I, I've been to various, <laughs> and it's always an interesting interaction, and certainly the service clubs do amazing work. The Rotary Club does amazing work, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'll again, sell you a ticket for our uh, 10K raffle coming up here in a little bit. 10k raffle as in a running race or no t- uh, 10k like we oh 10,000 the, the winner gets $10,000 oh, yeah so we well. sell 500 tickets at 100 bucks a piece so we raise 50 give somebody 10 and then uh do good work in the community with the other 40 well, well we can talk about that <laughs> offline <laughs> we'll put you on the spot right oh. now <laughs> so so you you get up to to Fort Collins and what was the motivation was it a better education experience just not quite such the boonies Fort Collins was still already Fort Fun in those days like, it wasn't the latter because I I you know I I was not um you know I, I didn't I wasn't a real big party person yeah, I, I yeah. actually in New York I was a bit of a party person and and to be honest uh, full disclosure that was part of my motivation for um mm, get I, out of I, there get out of thank you yeah. get get out of there i needed to change and a lot of folks uh you know cuz there were issues with people in, involved with alcohol and substances and all that and sure. and and i was on the periphery of that but i oh I, and that was like not long after woodstock and different things like that too <laughs> right know, it's, it's interesting <laughs> you were lsd in and all uh, you don't have to talk about it here um, well but i actually did ask my parents if I could go to Woodstock, 1969, but I was only in junior high school, and they said no. <laughs> however, however, 1973, I did go with a friend of mine, and this is when this might come later, but um, uh, with a friend of mine to Watkins Glen, New York, to see a, a I think it was a, a festival of sorts, but it was um, the Grateful Dead, the Allman Brothers Band, and the band. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. And we drove from, because back then we were into sports cars. The first car I ever owned was a 1965 MGB. Oh, sweet. And this and this <laughs> uh, friend of mine, Rick, who uh, wound up working for the post office, he had a 1959 MGA. Mm. And we drove it all the way up to Watkins Glen and... <laughs> and um, you know that was an experience. I'm I sure. Guess. I'm sure. Um, and so let's come up, bring it back to uh, CSU. You get engaged in the Fort Collins community. Get your degree finished up. Um, now, did was the Peace Corps before some of this or after college? It was after. Okay. It was after. So, um, being in in Fort Lewis, Durango, exposed me to the Four Corners area mm-hmm. and and uh, Canyon Country, Utah. And I got started getting involved in environmental kinds of issues, mm. and that carried over when I came up to CSU, and I was involved in in various um, act, you know various endeavors. It was like something called Colorado State State University CSU 
Eco Core, Environmental Core. Mm. We used to have a radio program back in the day called oh. Eco Logic. Oh, um, cool. So there were all those kinds of things. Yeah. And, and I think that was really important to me. It helped shape me in my journey. Graduated with my bachelor's degree in, in um, like I said, in, in May of 78. And, and then I decided, I had applied to, for Peace Corps. And so it was after, and it was um, February of 1979 when I was accepted. Originally, Peace Corps had said I would go to Africa to what was then known as Zaire, mm. and now is the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, yeah. So uh, that they said, no, we, we're canceling that. Because <laughs> it's a little too sketchy right now. <laughs> it's a little too sketchy right now. And then instead, I wound up going to El Salvador, mm. uh, which was even more sketchy. That's what I was going to say. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, I... Um, and that's where you picked up your Spanish. That's where... That's uh, Yes, yes, sir. I... That's where I learned my Spanish. You know, my, my native language is Greek. Growing up, we spoke Greek, so I actually mm. speak Greek. On good days, I speak pretty good English. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then Spanish has mostly stayed with me, and it's a, it's a good tool to have. It's yeah, a gift. That's awesome. It's a gift. So, yeah, Salvador, and it turns out that um, when I went in in February of 79, it was still a, a military dictatorship there. Mm. A lot of things were starting to happen, and then ultimately they evacuated us out of the country. So I was only wow. there for about... 13 months or so um and uh but it was an it was you know it was an amazing life-changing transformative experience and i it, as you said earlier kurt it, it, it certainly opened my eyes yes yeah yeah fair enough um and then what what from there did, was you done with your pro because it was a two-year program typically did they let you out early because you had to get evacuated or well, you gotta go yeah. clean gutters somewhere <laughs> yeah. yeah stateside uh, so i i came back uh in 1980 um, and I had the option of being reassigned. They were looking at having me go to Honduras, Honduras, or a Jamaica, Jamaica. And I, I came back to the States, and I gave that a lot, of, a lot of deliberation, a lot of thought. And in the end, I decided it would be too difficult to pick up the pieces and start all over again. Hmm. We were doing actually really good work. I worked as an agricultural extensionist, hmm. and we mm -hmm. were doing a lot of things related to, for example, soil and water conservation. Yeah. Uh, I was working at, towards the end when I was informed that, uh, by the way, uh, you have to be out of the country in a week, and nobody ever let me know that because I was five <laughs> hours away right. from the capital, San Salvador. But we were working with a group of women to establish um, a co-op uh, where they would raise chickens and sell, you know, sell the product and sell the eggs and mm -hmm. all of that. And then all of a sudden, you know, things um, got the way they did, yeah. and it was getting pretty serious there. There was a lot of violence. Um, all, all sorts of things, and then there were some Peace Corps volunteers that were working in the in the city in the uh, with people in the market there, the great the big market, mm -hmm. and and then there were some folks from the left, the FMLN who came and you know took over the market, and um, some of these Peace Corps volunteers were were held. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so long story short, I I came back. I decided um, uh, that what I had seen and experienced that I needed to stay here in in our country to try to make things you know to, to more better here educate people to make people aware of of that unfortunately sometimes um our government is not on the right side of history <laughs> and the kinds of you know what we supported in central america mm. i'm excited to talk about russia ukraine well <laughs> we'll see how that flows out yes. uh maybe we'll hit that in the political section later um, so what did you go about to do? And were you kind of an activist, kind of raising awareness I, I, for I, then uh, yeah. El Salvador and yes. things? Yes, all, all of that. So when I first came back, I wound up, um, I, I came back here because this, you know, this was my home base. Um, I, wanted to, I decided I wanted to be a teacher. I had my undergraduate degree. Mm. And so that's where I wound up going to, um, it's called Fairleigh Dickinson University in, in Teaneck, New Jersey. Okay. And part of the reason I went there was, one, is because it was closer to my dad, and it mm. was a good decision for two reasons. One is that um, I got to spend the last year that he was alive you know, together, yeah. and we made a lot of really powerful connections. Yeah. And also, my future wife, Beth... Um, <laughs> That's uh, where you found her? Well, and, and she actually... We grew up in the same neighborhood together, but we kind of hung out with different groups. Mm. And her dad was a Lutheran pastor. Her, her mom was a school teacher. But he had the church, um, a Lutheran church, like, you know, two blocks away from so where I grew up. So she Greek? No, she... I was going to say, uh, not uh, yeah. that many Greek Lutherans, really. No, not that many. But um, that was one of the things, especially for my mother, that she had to get used to. Yeah. Uh, if you ever watch the, um, the, the movie... 
uh, you you may have heard the term. Well, the term is xenophobic. Sena sure. is is foreign, and and so typically, if you follow the rules, you go to college, you get a good job, you marry, you know, you marry a good Greek woman, you make, you have babies, and then you feed the babies, and, uh, <laughs> and that's your main responsibilities in life. You know, and and so that didn't quite go according to plan. But <clears throat> before I went back east, um, and 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 got enrolled in this master's program, I actually worked. Um, uh, in, in Fort Collins, I worked with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I mm. was an independent living counselor, and that was part of my um, awareness and uh, regarding people with IDD. Yeah, kind of data and, set. And that was that. That's been a that's been a, a value, a passion of mine. That I, you know, through my legislative career, uh, through the work that I've done, is is how do we be more inclusive? And people that are dealing with those kinds of cognitive disabilities, sure. you know, h- how do we help them have meaningful lives and so forth? You know, what kind of support? So that I did that, went back east to start the master's program, taught in an inner city school, uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey, because it was a clinical approach. Spent time with my dad, connected with Beth, um, uh, and uh, ultimately. Much to my surprise, she actually... <laughs> she was game to marry you up and move back to Colorado. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, <laughs> oh boy, lots of stories. But even prior to that, if I had picked up on this, I was never really good at... I, I don't know if we need to get into that, but, um, you know, true confessions. But the whole relationship thing was a little bit hard for me, uh, hmm. I, I, to be honest. And uh, was I was... It like lack of confidence? Yeah, was it... yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, I was scared to death, you know, until yeah, I was but, yeah. 25. Yeah. But well, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, forgive me. I No, go ahead. Well, just that, um, so it was a bit of a surprise that, you know, we we, we, we courted. And, and actually, I like to say it was, um, so many stories, it was a package deal. Because like me, um, and had I picked up on this prior, she might have come out to Colorado when, when I first went out there. She wound up, Beth wound up going to Alaska. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, she was there with, and eventually she met someone who was a Vietnam um, War veteran mm, mm-hmm. and who was not well, uh, yeah. but together they had a child. Mm. And uh, Harlan is um, when we have two sons, and he's technically my stepson. Sure, uh, but he, I, you know, we raised him, and um, so so when when Beth and I were hooking up in New York there, and um, she had Harlan, he was like a year old or less. Sure. Yeah, she yeah. had to leave because there was a lot of domestic violence and things of that sure. nature. So it was a package deal. She's, I actually had the courage to uh, pr- pr- propose to her, and um, uh, we did it on a fire escape. Do you know what a fire escape is? Uh, well, I like ladders that go out the side of a <laughs> building, but I don't know what a fire escape is in the context you're saying here. Well, no, it, it's it's that, but I mean, it's, <laughs> it's you know, in in place like New York apartment buildings, you have fire escapes. People sure. go out, you watch the movies. You said you're a Netflix kind of a guy. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's where we did it. Yeah, um, the cops chase the criminals up and down the fire escapes and that kind of thing. Exactly. So, exactly, Kurt. Uh, so. It was a bit of a surprise, and it and it felt good, you know, to be yeah, affirmed. Yeah. But she said yes. We got married, and then um, you know we came back together, three of us, uh, in, yeah. in a small U-Haul, and you know we set up shop here and and didn't um, have the MGB anymore. No, uh, although I have fond memories of uh, you know those four cylinder engines, you can just oh, pull them, you can just pull them right out. And I remember we used to do work in the backyard, and and you didn't have a winch, so we just kind of had a chain going over a tree, t- right? You know, and you pull the engine out, and you try to change the cylinder. Put some new rings in there or whatever. <laughs> they were air cooled or no? They were liquid cooled. Uh, liquid cooled. Yeah. And I think it sounds like you know a little bit about b- British cars, but they had the Lucas electrical systems, yes. and they were not known to be 100% reliable. <laughs> they, they talk about the uh, Bosch electrical systems on the old BMWs and the makers of the world's first intermittent headlight switch <laughs> <laughs> instead of a wiper switch. <laughs> well, anyhow, I guess we should... I mean, I, we, should is, we should fast forward a little bit, otherwise we'll be here for three hours. I, I Just that... Um, so, you know... Basically got my master's, and I was a – so I've, I've also worked as a was teacher. A, I mean, that was 18 months or something like that, or, or two years, and, and you really connected with your dad, obviously, at a different yeah. level. You found Beth and, and her son and made them part of your family. Yes. And uh, moved them back out to be part of the world out west, no? Yes, and so my activism – I mean, at that point um, – 1982, I suppose. My father died June 5th, 1982. Um, you know, I, I came back to uh, to Colorado, 
and uh, started working as a teacher. I actually taught eighth grade science at uh, Bill Reed. Cool. Back then it was Bill Reed Junior High School. And, and But I was also very, I was, I guess I, you, the label is activist. And I was really focused on uh, international matters, peace yeah. and justice yeah, things. Yeah. And, and so that kind of informed, you know, the, the volunteerism and the activism. And eventually that, you know, the work that I did, I mean, it was everything from being a school teacher, uh, <coughs> mostly substitute teacher. Hmm. Um, and, and then I, you know, I, for example, I worked, <coughs> I started getting into human services. I worked th- seven years for the county uh, as a, mm-hmm. a job training counselor with that risk youth. I worked for Project Self Sufficiency for three years. Oh, you did as a as a yes. As I a, forgot it was even open that long. But Mary Mary Carher was the yeah. was the director. I, I I worked for Catholic Charities for seven years. So I was doing all that kind of nonprofit work, uh, focusing. I, I realized at some point <clears throat> that the international stuff is terribly important, and it helped inform some of the other experiences I had over time. Sure. Uh, I spent you know I I'd gone a number of times as a part of a delegation. For example, to Chiapas, Mexico, mm. I got hooked up with an organization that was uh, building relationships and helping to build schools and clinics in Chiapas, Mexico. Oh yeah, and that back then the Rotary Club did something with that with Tracy Mead and John Carroll and different things where they took a bunch of suburbans down there. Yeah, yeah. You might have been part about well, part of that later or and, a legacy of that. And and in those days, you know, the um, when when Clinton was president, there was NAFTA. And and there was you you probably are aware since you are a student of history and so many other things uh, the the whole Zapatista thing and well mm. but but there was um, a, a lot of pushback because of NAFTA and how it was impacting you know in, indigenous communities there mm. and so ultimately I was able to go down and as part of the, this organization out of San Diego Escuelas para Chiapas again building relationships supporting the work that they were doing but it was always a very um, tense time because the military was occupying many of the areas, and mm, there mm. was there was some pretty scary moments. Yeah, talk to me about what. And I don't want to go too long, but what was it about NAFTA that, like, was really impacting the indigenous peoples? I've I've come back recently from uh, Cancun, where the the Mayas are still, you know, there's some sense of almost second class citizens for Mexico in that space or if if you will sure and uh, but I don't know really the impact on a on a national well, or a the, federal level sure there were a lot of things but I think the 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 main thing is that the concerns were that the provisions of the North American free trade agreement were such that um the the traditional agricultural uh, methods and the access to mm. the you know the access to what was available because a lot of it is tropical right, jungles right. Uh, there, there were concerns that a lot of that would be yeah, like cut down all this jungle and all, make all coffee that. plantations. And that yeah, there were those of kinds of issues, and and again, it was kind of in violation of what you know they wanted to live the way they have lived yeah. historically. They didn't. So, not only did they not really want to be part of Mexico, they certainly didn't want to be part of the greater world order or whatever. And, and, and it, there was a quote, or not just yeah, Mexico, but and there was Honduras, a yeah, whatever, there was a there. Zapatista rebellion, and mm. and there was um you, yeah. there, there was a, a, a nineteen. 91 perhaps um but ultimately they they created a whole movement and, and it's mostly been nonviolent, which has been always been very important to me yeah so i guess what i'm trying to get at is that my focus was a lot on international peace and justice kinds of things but in the meantime i was starting to realize that you know what happens closer at home like at the state level with mm. the legislature mm-hmm. issues related to homelessness and housing um uh, economic development, how to, you know, how, how do folks can get the training and, and overcome the barriers, like especially single parents and so on and so mm-hmm. forth, to get jobs and to lead meaningful yeah. lives. Well, so that's a, where I started to shift. A lot of different threads, because you've got your time with Project Self-Sufficiency, with your developmentally disabled people and things like that, and you're like, oh, there's a lot of complex challenges to fix, and we can't have 87 bandages. we got to have a little bit more thoughtfulness in what we do. So... Yes, and it's a good way to frame it. Thank you. And and uh, I mean, ultimately, my my focus shifted a bit. Um, still involved in these other kinds of things. I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to go to places like Nicaragua, um, like Nicaragua, and uh, yeah. uh, I went back to El Salvador in 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 1987 and so on. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah. Uh, careful. Almost tipped it over. Um, so. But realizing that issues closer to home in our community were really important, and that's where I, yeah. I, I got involved there. And it was um, it was 2000, the year 2000, where 
for the first for the first time I start thinking what about running for public office because yeah. I hadn't honestly yeah. I really hadn't thought about that hmm. and I gave it some thought for all the the reasons but I waited because um I just did yeah. and then I decided to run for office in um 2004 uh, House District 52 back in the day okay. and I was unsuccessful and that's that's a bit of a story in itself but um uh, so I lost that uh, the general election. Yeah. There was a primary. I won the primary by nine votes, yeah. uh, and 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 so on. Wow! But anyway, let's actually um, let's huh. take a short break and then come back to the start of your political career. Okay. If that's okay. Yeah. All right. The Loco Experience is sponsored by In Motion, providing next day delivery for local businesses. If you need anything delivered in Northern Colorado, In Motion's flat fee service is a great resource for your business. Delivering from the Wyoming border to Denver and anywhere in between, their clients range from small breweries to real estate companies. InMotion can deliver almost anything you can imagine. If this fits a need for your business, contact InMotion directly by emailing them at InMotionNoCo at gmail.com. That's I-N-M-O-T-I-O-N-N-O-C-O at gmail.com and mention you heard it on the Loco Experience. And so I want to go back to, you mentioned an employment services organization that you worked for um, immediately before kind of getting into into government role. But talk to me about, so you, you left kind of the nonprofit space a little, or left teaching to get into kind of various nonprofit space things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I worked for various nonprofits over the years. I um, was involved in efforts. For example, uh, you know, they talk about, the, you know, issues related to homelessness. Sure. We actually... Um, Worked with various uh, uh, partners to establish something called uh, New Bridges, which was a, oh. one of the first daytime homeless shelters back in the day. Uh, but but ultimately, for various reasons, the best I could do with being a school teacher was as a substitute teacher. Mm-hmm. And and um, and I, I guess once again, to be honest and full disclosure, um, it, I think it's related to my activism and, and some of the things that I was involved in. And mm. and and so the school district made a decision that. Um, as far as I could go, would be substitute teacher. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. Um, yeah, ter- there's there's uh, that no good deed goes unpunished a little bit, and well, you were a little too visible for their tastes. And uh, you're, you're, I remember when when Facebook first started kind of being a thing and stuff. I was uh, like a senior vice president at the bank and and different things, and I just I've always kind of said whatever I think, and I just just because I say something doesn't even mean I think it necessarily. Um, but my, one of my friends, well, John Shaw, you've known John forever, probably. He's like, Kurt, does the bank care about all the things you say on your Facebook? I'm like, I don't know. I've never given it a thought, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but it definitely yeah. could have impacted me uh, in uh, the same uh, way. And, uh, and ultimately, so I think it was the summer of 87. <clears throat> I got a temporary job with the county, Larimer County back in the day. Mm-hmm. And I worked as a, I think it was called a community health outreach worker. Okay. And it was working with, um, uh, migrants who were working out in the fields, like the onion mm, fields, mm-hmm. and we were making sure that the kids had access to, yeah. to, to check school, their eyes, check, check their, their eyes, ears. you know, dental and all of that. So that was a pretty, that was another one of those darn life changing experiences. <laughs> and then ultimately, that helped me to get a job with Larimer County, and that's where I worked as um uh, as a job training a counselor and m- m- working mostly with at risk youth, but. You know, back in those days, for example, we used to do a lot of on-the-job training experiences, and and I'm really, you know, it's it's always a a great thing when those of us who have been around the block, you run into young people that you helped either through Project mm-hmm. Self Sufficiency or the job training, and like they're doing really well, and they, you know, their kids have grown up, and even if they were a sung- single parent, they've overcome those barriers. So, yeah, yeah. working for the county, uh, working for Project Self Sufficiency, eventually working for Catholic Charities for for seven years, um, mm. and then ultimately, you know, starting to make the shift. I worked for a nonprofit group out of out of Denver, uh, but ultimately making the shift to you know to run for public office. Yeah, yeah. So talk to me about that first run. I had uh, Tom Lucero on a few months ago, and he said, uh, you know, one thing is you heard it even maybe on the conversation. If you either one of the three things is going to falter your business your personal life he was talking about getting divorced actually his first time or your political role and i and i basically responded you know well i'm not really willing for my business or my family to suffer and so can i just be a half-assed public servant is that better than not at all um but for me it was actually the statement that said maybe it's time to wait you know because i've thought about that but 
I don't really want to do one of those three things poorly. Did you feel that same thing? Yeah, I, yes. And, and I think oftentimes people still come to me for advice about running for public office. And one of the first things I, I say to them is if you have uh, young children, you really need to give it a lot of thought. Because mm. running for office and then serving, especially at the state legislature, which technically you're supposed to be part-time citizen legislators, right. it can be very um, demanding you know, on your family life, on your children. Yeah, and, it doesn't pay that much either. And right. back, back then, the base pay, when I was in the legislature, it's gone up a bit. It was thirty grand a year. Yeah. And yeah. then you would get per diem and all of that. So... And how old were your kids when you? Well, they were they were so my my older son, this you know my son Harlan, yeah. he was born in eighty, and so he would have been um, a oh, teenager. So was, uh, yeah. And and Tim, our, uh, who works at CSU, uh, who is a big that's another story is uh, he's a big ultimate frisbee guy. If you okay. know much about ultimate, I've played a few times. Well, he he's uh, he's somewhat um, what's the word near uh, famous near famous actually. Uh, but if we have time, we can get into that. <laughs> Fair enough. But you'll have to invite me back, <laughs> a, sequ- a sequel or something. Well, um, we'll have a f- family segment later uh, here, and so you can talk about the Ultimate Frisbee then. That's very cool. Um, in any event, so, yeah, I, I think uh, I made that decision. I, I waited. I delayed because in 2000, uh, for that particular House District 52 seat, there was somebody on, on the Democratic side who was running, and I didn't feel like I needed to you know, compete for that. Yeah. And, and that person actually was successful. This would have been 2000 to 2002. And then in 2002, that person he only served one term. No, chose not to do it well, anymore. Well, no, he got or... beat. He got oh, beat. okay. And then the person who beat him is the person uh, who I ran that against. That you beat two years in, later. Uh, well, it, it was actually, so in, in 04, uh, I announced to run. And um, and then part ways through that, um I don't know if you remember back in the day, uh, the mayor, the city of uh, Fort Collins, Mayor Pro Tem, Bill Birchie, uh, he mm-hmm. used to run the uh, CSU so. Mountain Campus, the uh, uh, up there. Uh, okay. Pingree Park. I moved away from like oh two to oh seven, effectively. Yeah. So he, um, I announced to run and under, you know, began the campaign. And then in April, he announced that he would be running. So we had a primary. Oh. And back then, the primary election was in August. Okay. And at the end of the day, um, I was uh, I was ahead by, I think, seven votes. And because of that, it kicked it into a recount. Oh. And so it took three weeks to kind of tally things up, and we lost some momentum. Ultimately, I prevailed. And then in the general election, you know, we lost by a couple of hundred votes. Oh. But my, I don't even use the word opponent anymore. My my um, competitor uh, was Bob McCluskey, and you may oh, know Bob. I do know Bob. And, and actually, I think the world of him. I, you know, we always had a good relationship. We yeah. always were very s- civil and respectful with each other with yeah. regard to campaigns. Wasn't he involved with the Liberty Common School or something like that? Too? You might be. Or you, that's you a different Bob. Be Bob Schaefer. Bob Schaefer, yeah. And yeah. that's it. That's another interesting story. There are lots of interesting stories that I, the ones that I can remember. But again, Kurt, long story short, um, we lost in the 04 election. Then I went back and ran again, and that would have been in 06, and I was successful. Okay. So Bob and I sort of had a two out of three match, and I won set two out of three, <laughs> and then kind of kept going from there. So um, <laughs> so that's the House of Representatives. Yes. Uh, and can you give a quick like two minutes on what that job looks like in comparison. You've kind of talked about what a county commissioner does and whatever. Um, what's the representative? And then later you became a senator. So let's talk about both of those things now. Like what, what's the difference a little bit? Well, one difference, of course, is that in the Colorado state legislature, it's in the Constitution, <clears throat> but we have 100 state legislators. Okay. You have 65 state reps, and, and then you have 35 state senators. Oh. And even though the population of the Colorado changes, uh, you you can't change the number of legislators unless it goes to a vote of the people because it's in oh, the Constitution. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if a lot of folks know that. So our voice just gets more and more diluted every year, basically. Well, but then that's part of why every <laughs> 10 years they do the redistricting. Right. And, and ideally, a state rep should be representing about 90,000 folks and about double that for a state senator. Sure, okay. So that that's one difference. But, I mean, ultimately... House District 52 back then was mostly um, the east side of Fort Collins, the north side, kind of where we live in the Martinez Park neighborhood. Yep, yep. And and um, oh, we're neighbors. 
Yeah, it's it's a good neighbor. <laughs> yep. And that's another thing we could have a conversation about. We bought our house on Sycamore Street in 1988, mm. and. Um, you know, for a price that's thirty four thousand or four, something. Actually, you're good, uh, forty seven. <laughs> Fair. And and uh, the the property taxes I just paid were not on forty seven. Oh, no, no. Well, we bought our house on Laporte in Whitcomb. Um, no kidding, on Laporte in, in Whitcomb. Two thousand and nine. Interesting. Yeah, um, and uh, for two fifty two, I think, and I don't know what it's worth, but it's more than that. Well, we're at four twenty eight. That sounds about according right. According to the assessor. But all that said, um, uh, yeah, I, th- th- being a state representative, you know, you're in the legislative branch. You do policy. Uh, you 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 try to engage the the the, the community. I mean, that's always been a, a really important thing to me. I, yeah. I I believe I had a hand in starting this whole idea of um, what we call community conversations or listening sessions, mm-hmm. and that was I always felt that being an elected official, even though you don't get paid much and all of that, you're a part-time citizen legislator. But part of the job description is you got to be out there in the community. Yeah, and yeah. so we would, you know, we would create these opportunities for folks to ask questions, to push back, to you know, give ideas on legislation. Yeah. So you 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 try to, you know, and, and I've actually taught at CSU. I don't know if you knew that as I well. I didn't. No. I, well, that was my next question. Actually, I was going to say you were a part-time citizen legislator, and so. What did you do with your other part time? Well, you had little side hustles at CSU and things, I guess. Just, um, I, I think, um, you know, my wife was working. She worked at a, as a, a music, um, a, a worship assistant at Redeemer Lutheran. For, oh, is that right? For um, uh, nineteen years. Oh, wow! And so there was income coming there. There was, you know, I was very frugal, um, but ultimately I didn't really have other jobs other than in the Senate. I was asked by the School of Social Work at CSU if I would teach a graduate course on public policy. Mm. And, and that was not because I had a, um, a, deg- a Bachelor of Social Work or a Master's of Social Work. It was because I had you know, direct experience. <laughs> 20 years of yeah. advocacy and so, engagement in various ways. So I had that, and I th- that, was a, that was a really good gig, and I really enjoyed teaching a lot. But I guess um, uh, to bring it all back, uh, that's what you do in the legislature. You... You try to identify, and this is what I would do with my, my students, you know, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Uh, is there a role for government? What's the cost to the taxpayer? Yeah. I mean, there are some key questions you got to ask. Yeah, what are those want, unintended consequences? What are those unintended consequences? You know, the pros and cons, who are the winners and losers? How do you bring home, uh, you know, I'm very passionate about this stuff to do it right, and it's not easy, yeah. but bring, bringing forth stakeholders and, and making sure that, if you know, and we've been up against you know like David and Goliath kind of thing, but ultimately, if you do the process right, you can come up with good policy that does identify the role of government in trying to solve problems. But of course, it's not always up to government, uh, you know, to to solve problems. It's really up to the community, and government, in my opinion, has a role. So you you yeah. um you get that input, you work with people, you ultimately you know have legislation or bills, and you pass laws that hopefully address real community needs. There's a really um, uh, fascinating podcast conversation I just listened to. I don't know. Have you ever listened to the Lex Friedman podcast? No, by chance? no. He just had on, um, and I listened to it yesterday and today, um, Tim Urban is huh. the guy's name. And Tim's book is, um, I'm just looking it up on my little app here, uh, What's Our Problem? A Self-Help Book for Societies. And one of the one of the big things he shared, I guess almost the base premise, if I had to, to say it, is that we spend too much time focusing on the horizontal issues. Like, here, here's what I think about abortion, and if you don't agree with that, you're stupid. Here's what I think about gun control, and if you don't believe that, you're stupid. Instead of looking at the, the ladder, the height of the conversation, like we spend a ton of time on social media and otherwise in our reptile brain and not thinking with our full intellectual curiosity and being uh, in communion together and and benefiting from that collaborative solution thing that allowed us to create culture and and instead to go up the ladder. And I was just talking to my team about the fact that what we do at Loco Think Tank is basically creating spaces to go up the ladder of communication and and understanding. And it's interesting, Kurt, uh, this is all very interesting, actually. (laughs) Um, Just last Wednesday... I attended the uh, community meeting at the at the library, you know, Old Town Library, that was put on. Oh, the Braver uh, Angels event. Well, oh. they're, yeah, they're, they they highlighted the Braver Angels, but I I think the title of the event was "Crossing Political Divides," mm. and that's an example of a goal that I've set for myself. 
this year as a county commissioner is how do we, you know, what can we do tangibly to try to rebuild some of the trust? Yeah. You know, certainly yeah. COVID, COVID and, all, and the pandemic didn't help any of that. <laughs> True. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. Uh, but th- it was a really, really excellent um, presentation. The the uh, community room was packed, and, and they had, um, uh, you know, Martine Carcasson was there from the Center for Public Deliberation. And then I didn't even know that, that it existed, but there's something called the Northern Colorado a deliberative journalism project. Mm. So I thought that was really oh. great. And they talked about the Braver Angels and uh, other best practices, uh, resources that are out there. They highlighted this one person from a TED a, a TED talk. that mm. It was all very fascinating. Yeah. And that's important to me. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I agree fully. And so um, I think that's uh, wow. one of the... I'm a, I, I don't know. You probably don't read my blog, but I'm kind of a diehard small government libertarian type of fellow and so some might think that we have a lot of uh, strife but I'm also a communitarian I want the best for people and we in some places have different ideas about how to accomplish that but starting with knowing that we each want the best for people is a good place to start from well and 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 perhaps um that's a good segue into you know as I've been I've been doing this for a while not that I know everything about it but one of the things that I've really learned, and I try to put it into practice, I'm not always successful. Can swing that back. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. Um, but the, you know, I, I often say to folks, you know, God gave us two ears and one mouth. Uh, we should listen twice as much as we speak. And I and I find the, I tried to put that in, in, into practice. But I also, you know, one of the experiences that I had, Kurt, was in 2002. I actually went to Israel and Palestine, mm, mm-hmm. and and it was part of a delegation. There's something called the Compassionate Listening Project, mm. and it focuses on you know you go through a training, you know, listening from the heart, setting aside your biases, mm. and when you're sitting down with somebody who you may not agree with, not necessarily trying to jump in and say, oh, how am I how am I going to change this person's mind? Yeah. How do we look at it collaboratively? How do we go up, you know, up upstream, up you know, yeah. go vertically rather than horizontally? And, and I've tried to put that into practice, that if I'm sitting down, I think it's important to be able to sit down with folks who, who you may not agree with. And it's not so much about, I hope this makes sense, it's not so much about trying to change their mind about something, but it is, in my opinion, it is about better understanding where they're coming from. Totally. And, and a lot of times, if people have opinions that maybe seem irrational or something, uh, they, they're based out of fear, they're based out of anger, and, 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 and it, it applies to you know whether you're on the left end of the political spectrum or the right end of the p- political yep. spectrum or wherever libertarians fit, fit into that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, and, um, but I just think it's, um, it's, it's, just, you know, it's just really important. Well, I've, I've kind of given uh, up trying to change people's minds. Uh, only you can change your mind. Yeah. is my notion and only anybody else listening to this conversation they you can only change your own mind you can only make yourself act you can only be responsible for your own financial and educational successes and some people can walk alongside you and help you understand better and questions can help too and i think part of that conversation is i mean the best way that we can influence others perhaps is is by example right yeah you know by example, live, live the, you know, be a good role model, especially for the children. And ultimately, um, you know, some of that, you know, spills over uh, with other folks. And, and I think we have to be willing to accept and embrace that other people might have some valid viewpoints <laughs> yeah, yeah. and they might have some answers that you hadn't thought of to a very complex problem. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And, and understanding that we all have different perspectives and bits of information to add into the sauce of, of greater understanding uh, is pretty clutch. So how <laughs> how does that play out in like things like your legislative experience and the the Senate and the representatives? Or is there a lot of, is there time for that? Is there space for that? Or is it more like the bully pulpit and the cultures of who can build the coalitions of the, the money to elite? Well, I would say that there are it's not easy, but there is time for that, and it's really important. And I know that one of my my things when I was in the legislature, both in the House and the Senate, was this whole, um, I would try to get every year at the beginning of the session uh, to pass a resolution around civility. Mm, yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and, you yeah. Know, so so that's, that's important. And I, again, I think if you want to be a good legislator, 
if you want to be someone who is a public servant, who tries to be authentic and does a good job of listening, you have to be willing to sit down with, you know, who are the stakeholders? What is the issue you're trying to address? And bring folks in who, you know, may push back. But in the end, I think you can come up with much better policy when you engage in that kind of process. And it's not easy, and it typically takes longer, yes. Yeah, fair enough. Um, what else would you have people know about what being a public servant is like? It feels like, you know, maybe there's some people out there th- thinking about it themselves. You mentioned already, you know, if you got little kids, maybe think twice or whatever. But, yeah, describe, like, the, the, the space of living that life that you've lived the last 20 years. Yes, um, it's an interesting space, and... I suppose if you talk to my spouse, you might get, you know, and that's... <laughs> I'm sure she's proud of you. She, I have no question she, about that. She is, but, you know, it's it's not a but. It's an and. Um, it's not been without sacrifice. And, you know, yeah. most when I've been doing this, our kids have been mostly grown up. But I realized that for the last 20 years, I've worked most of the time. Yeah. And, and, and so I think I've lost some things. And now as I get older... And especially having a five-year-old granddaughter that I brag about all the time, yeah. who is brilliant. You should get her on your show someday. Although she's very, <laughs> she's 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 brilliant. I mean, it, it would knock your I socks don't doubt off. At all. And uh, but she's very shy. She's very shy. Uh, it, so so it's not been an easy twenty years. And um, I'm realizing, especially as I get older, because we're on this, you know, we're on this, yeah, yeah. we're in this in this life for a, a temporary amount of time. I I, I want to reconnect with my family. <laughs> with my friends, you know, those kinds of things. Well, so and I'm I, thinking about that early lust for travel and adventure and backpacking in the boonies and stuff. Yeah. I mean, you've sacrificed quite a bit of that stuff too, probably because of the, just the busyness of your commitments here. That is correct. And so, um, I mean, to your question, I think that, you know, as a public servant, as an elected person, as a county commissioner, uh, it is very, it, it can be very rewarding, but I would be, somewhat disingenuous if I didn't say there weren't times when it was it can be very stressful and and um you know I, I mean I as a county commissioner especially I think in a lot of ways it's harder because you're dealing with everything mm. from potholes <laughs> right uh, from potholes to trying to figure out how we're going to address the lack of affordable housing right uh, in in this you know in our community and 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 so it, it it's rewarding especially when you make connections with folks um, and but it can also be it can also be very challenging because the issues that we deal with, whether they're oil and gas development, uh, whether they're um, trying to update our regulations, another hot topic right now. You never would have thought it's right up there with oil and gas and climate change and everything else. It's short term rentals. Right. Right. Um, it's a big deal. It makes a big difference. It's a big deal and it makes a big difference. So one thing I tell folks and, and I'll pause after this, and that is. If you're going to run for office, you got to really think about why you want to, why you, why you're doing that. What are your intentions? Um, how does that affect your family and your friends? How does that affect work-life balance? But I think ultimately, people have to be authentic. People have to be genuine. <coughs> I think, especially in Lambert County, folks get it. They don't want someone who just does stump speeches. Uh, yeah. And and so I think it's really important that you are and present yourself. <clears throat> as someone who's genuine, who's a regular person, who happens to be doing this job as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we're still, while we're still in your career, you just faced a a very challenging opponent for the county commissioner spot in Justin Smith uh, last fall. Um, You you eked out actually a a pretty substantial victory. You know, I don't know what, a a couple thousand votes or something. Actually, something like nineteen thousand. But who's counting? Yeah, Uh, it was. I believe it was like ten percentage points. Yeah, almost ten. Yeah, bigger than bigger than I guessed it. Honestly, not because I don't like Justin or don't like you or whatever. I was just kind of. What do you think the difference was in in that race with such a frankly high name recognition candidate uh, in our region? Good darn good question. First, let me share, you know, the, the common ground that we were both operating off of. So I announced, I think, back in December of last year that I was running for, I would run for re-election. And then in early January, uh, a couple of days before Justin Smith announced that he would be running for the, the county commissioner's seat, he actually called me as a courtesy to let, let me know that. And I thought that was very... Um, very courteous, very gracious, and all of that. 
And I said, that's great, Justin. Uh, the only thing I would ask, and we had a, a gentleman's agreement, a verbal agreement, is let's stick to the high road. Uh, let's not go down the road of, uh, you yeah. know. Name calling or different things. All of, all of those kinds of things. And and that's how the campaign was um, was undertaken. And I, and I think that's what people would expect. Those are the expectations that the voters of Larimer County have. And I think the voters of this country have. And we don't always uh, deliver uh, the, way, <laughs> the way we ought to. Yeah, fair. But, but that's how I've always tried to do it. And, and both Justin and I work from that space. And I think what, you know, what contributed to our success is, you know, we've had experience running successful campaigns. I realized that as a county commissioner, honestly, uh, Kurt, it, it can be a 24-7 job. Right. Um, uh, and, and so what I've done in the past with campaigning and being out knocking on doors and canvassing, which are really important, especially since COVID has kind of subsided. Yeah. Um, I wasn't able to do that. So, and and even the the I'm not the typical person. You know, you always get all these requests for money, and right. I know money is a part of it. But actually, we raised half the amount of money as we did the previous campaign, and we had the same wow. kind of outcome. And I I guess I attribute that that to maybe two things. One is there is a bit of a track record here. I mean, I've been doing this for a while. I, I have, just like Justin, the former sheriff, have name recognition. Yep. And and I think one of the things that I, I believe is real is that a lot of folks um, who may not agree with me respect me. Yeah, and I we would have, agree with and, that. And we have those relationships. Well, I think you're, like, even with those of us and the community that disagree with you, they would say, you know, John Kafalas, he's authentic. He has integrity. You know, I don't know how he comes to those conclusions on some things even when they disagree, right? But that I trust him to do what he thinks is the right thing to do. Um, whereas too many people are swayed by uh, the, you know, whatever, the opportunities later or things like that. I mean, yeah, we'll talk more about politics specifically later. But And, and I don't have a whole lot of political aspirations. I've always viewed this as a way of doing public service yeah. um, and trying to bring folks together. And you know, one of the things that might cause you to chuckle or smile is I remember running, not for the commissioner thing, but prior, I can't remember. One of the set of races. One of those whatever. darn races. But I remember t in two yards, I saw, well, it had to be when John McCain and Sarah Palin were running for, uh, okay, yep. would that have been 08, perhaps? I suppose, yeah, or maybe <coughs> maybe 12. Maybe 12. Anyway, the-, the In the, Obama's the, second term? I the, don't know. The, the, the funny thing is that um, there were two front yards- where there was a um, a yard sign for John McCain and Sarah Palin and Kafalas. Right. Yeah. Go figure. That's uh that's pretty significant. That should be on the front page of your Facebook site. Well, and I've had a you know over time anecdotally, quite a number of folks have said you know I they're in the other political party and they said you're the first person of your political political party that I voted for. Mm, interesting. Um, yeah, I think that's probably reasonable. Anyhow. Yeah. What's next for you? Are you gonna keep that county commissioner role for a while you got a lot of juice in your in your fire it still seems like but i realized today that you're quite a bit older than i expected to find you know that how old i am i you know you must be at least 20 years older than me and i'm 48 so 68 is that maybe you're 70 no no 68 let's leave it at that. <laughs> okay somewhere right up there no i was born in 1954 you were born in 74 yeah there we are oh gosh um so i just got reelected. I'm a month and a half into my second term, so that's where my focus is right now. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of work before is us. Is there term limits on county commissioners? There, there, yes. The, the short answer is yes, and there are three three terms, three four-year terms. Oh. So I, I, I would have the option of running for a third term, yeah. uh, in, I guess, in 2026. But right now, I'm really focused on continuing Fair. to do the job. I, I like to say, keep my nose to the grindstone. Um, a lot of critical issues before us. Yeah. Um, what What are those maybe top three critical issues for Larimer County? I think you probably mentioned some of it on the affordable housing and, and workforce. Is that two of them? Well, you or know. Infrastructure got to be a big one, too. All of those things. I, I guess what when you ask that question, certainly on the workforce side of things and the economic development side of things, a lot of credit should go to um, uh, Larimer County and, well, the Fort Collins Chamber of Commerce, all of the various business groups. And, local think tank. Well, and local think tank. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because, and the um, the Weld County Employment Services. 
Uh, clearly, that's where we've come together for a regional approach yeah. to dealing with uh, economic development and yep, yep, um, for sure. uh, uh, workforce. So I think that's an example of of, of people coming together and, and, and dealing, you know, addressing the issues. Um, other things that are front and center, I would offer, Kurt, you know, the um, the solid waste issue. So mm. you're probably, you've read in the paper that recently the county agreed to go into negotiations with Republic Services to do a public-private partnership yeah. uh, regarding the the construction and the operation of the new landfill that will go um, seven miles north of um, uh, Wellington on County Road Nine up towards Rawhide. Okay, uh, and I can I can talk about. I that haven't read about that yet, but well, it's, it's significant. It's, so well, and is Republic is are they now a, a city sponsored monopoly? As well, and and what about Ram Waste? What happened there? So there were two questions there. Um, <laughs> they technically they're not uh, yet a um, a city sponsored monopoly. Uh, there was a something in the paper where I think it was first reading with city council, or at least uh, regarding um, they they put out an RFP just like we put out an RFP for the uh, for the landfill, the transfer station, right. and the and then expanded recycling center. Uh, but they put out an RFP. The preferred vendor was um, was Republic Services, and so assuming that it goes through the various readings and however the Many city steps, pro- yeah, yeah, that that's um, they will be the, um, the 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 single hauler. People will have options, and that's more on the residential side, which I think represents twenty mm. percent of the the garbage that uh, comes out of Fort Collins. But both the city of Fort Collins and county were very committed to diversion. And so, for example, in the MOU that we established with Republic Services, mm-hmm. we want to get to 50% diversion mm. uh, by 2030, for example. And, of course, the city is at, you know pushing for, and we agree for n- net zero waste or whatever sure. is, is called. So so they are not quite there yet, but assuming if the city council approves the contract, well, approves moving forward with the contract, they still got to work out the contract. Yeah. Just like we are in the process of negotiating a contract with Republic, uh, that's how that would you know go down. Your other question had to do with ram waste. Um, what what's interesting, I think it's interesting, and this is a big issue. We got to deal with the solid waste issue and the recycling yeah. issue, and that is that um, you know it used to be Gallegos. They were a family owned sure. business. They they were the main thing in town, um, and 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 then of, co- of course Loveland has their own trash hauling service, and they bring their recycling and their trash up to the landfill up you know okay. over there on Taft Hill. But otherwise, it's commercial haulers, you know, the private sector. So Gallegos sold to Republic. Yep. Um, Ram Waste, actually, there's another national company called Waste Connections. Okay. They bought out Ram Waste. Oh, really? And then, of course, we have Waste Management, which is the third oh, right. national company, and they've been operating, and they have- When well, they've got control over the, at least one of the dumps, too, kind of, right? Well, or something? They, or they had some involvement in funding of the other dump, maybe? They, they have- uh, they have their own dump, as you the put east it. The east facility over... Yeah, on, on Highway uh, 14, 14, towards yeah. Alt. So that is their, their privately owned uh, landfill. See. So there's the one that the county is running that's going to close up in uh, by 2024. And that's why there's some urgency mm. in building this new landfill and this transfer station and, and on and <laughs> well, on. Well, waste management is like, well... You're filling up. We have the only place to haul stuff right now. There's an interesting, some leverage stuff going on there, I well, imagine, too. Yeah, but the goal, of course, is ultimately to try to um, minimize as much as we can what goes into the dump yeah. and, and look at markets and, and you know, recycling. Well, maximize efficiencies, maximize, minimize yeah. waste, all those things. Why do we burn trash? Why do we or why, why don't, don't we? we? It uh, seems like, I mean, especially if you're thinking about like Europe, they started burning wood and coal and a bunch well, of stuff this year because of shortage of energy. Well, and well, I don't see the solar and wind thing really capturing a lot more market share unless there's significant battery or efficient storage. And so right now we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place and we got dumps filling up all over the country. Well, I would say <laughs> anyway, that uh, why, big we, question. Well, why we don't burn um, garbage is... And unless it's done properly, there you know there can be significant issues sure. with emissions. And I, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because when I grew up in New York, you know, we used to have you know the 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 city the city of New York has their sanitation department, and they would incinerate a lot oh, of the trash. Right? Oh. Yeah, uh, and 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 but there are new technologies 
that look at um, pyrolysis and those kinds of things. So there might be some opportunities there. But but historically, we've not burned garbage because it puts up too much pollution. Yeah, to yeah. Do it right. So that that's the reason there. And as far as the the landfill that's out on Taft Hill, I mean, part of how we how we've um, extended the life of the landfill is, you know, we've looked at uh, different practices around compaction, mm-hmm. you know, the equipment that we have out there. And I don't know if you ever thought of this, but um, remember when we had that mega hailstorm a couple of years ago sure. and everybody had to replace their roofs? Right. Well, that took off about three months from the landfill because of all those shingles. Right. We didn't have the proper way to recycle or reuse those shingles. Right. And those shingles are huge, high density sources of energy in a way because it's basically oil. Yeah. You know, packed in with a little bit of rock for protecting the yeah. the car. So, so to your question a few minutes ago, you know, the the dealing with the solid waste issue is is a front and center issue. Yeah, seems like and, it. And and um, you know, for example, I'll be up in Wellington. I I do these community conversations. I do yeah, like three or four yeah. a month. Laporte, Red Feather, Wellington, etc. Um, and we'll be up there on March second, and we will be talking, providing an update on the yeah. landfill stuff. But also, Republic Services has gotten. Uh, it's interesting that people in Wellington are not happy with the customer service. Well, I was just thinking uh, NIMBY is likely the case, too. Well, well it's it, not just the customer service, but they also don't want a bunch of trucks going up and down their county road up there, right? Well, the, the trucks are, and we've had those conversations, and that's part of the intergovernmental agreements, and that's part of the agreement, ultimately, the contract with um, uh, with the Republic, is they're not going to they, they're not going to go up and down the county roads. Oh, good. So there is a, there is a preferred route, and that route will be from the transfer station that's going to be where the current site is, ultimately those trucks that are going to bring it up to the landfill are going to go out to I-25 and go up and then come in on Al Canyon. Yeah, County that makes Road sense 70. to me. Yeah. And, and so so that's a bit really front and center issue. Another one that comes to mind that I think uh, there's less um, contentiousness perhaps, and that is uh, behavioral health. Mm. So you know the voters passed the sales tax initiative, the yep. county sales tax thing in 2018. mental health support kind yeah, of. Yeah, and so... Um, this fall, we're, we're going to complete the construction of the behavioral health facility mm. right there on, on... Good thing, because people have been getting crazier faster than ever the last couple of years yeah, uh, as yeah. well. Well, and this is dealing with mental health issues, and it's also dealing with substance use disorder. Mm. So mm-hmm. we'll have the facility... Yeah, faci- both of those things. We'll have the facility, uh, and it'll provide some crisis. It'll actually have a detox center, for example. Oh, yeah. We've never had We've that We've been hauling people to Greeley for detox for 20 years or something. Exactly. <laughs> so... Um, so I would love to yeah. spend another hour just talking about regional issues and stuff, and we can have a coffee or something later uh, and do that. I but would like that. I want to make sure we get into the the faith family politics segments here, and uh, you can start wherever you wish. I want to make sure that we have a chance to talk about ultimate frisbee and uh, mm-hmm. your family development. So, if you'd like, maybe we, I'd invite you to start there. Um, so, what, what was your older son's name? Your stepson? So. Our- our, uh, my older son, our older son, excuse me, is Harlan. Harlan, and yeah. And he, um, uh, interesting, he graduated from Poudre High School uh, in the first uh, international baccalaureate class back in 90, 98, and he went to CU, mm-hmm. uh, was not happy there, and ultimately, um, much to our surprise, in 1999, called us up one day and said, uh, Dad, I think you need to sit down, i got to tell you something. Because he was down in Louisville living because he was at CU. Yeah. He said, I'm joining the Army. Oh, wow. So he served in the Army for 22 years, retired in 2021. Wow. Um, and he has three kids. Okay. Um, and right now they're living in Missouri, and there's a bit of a story to that. So that's um, Harlan is our old, older son, and, and, and uh, the woman he married, Tracy, he actually met, she was a navigator on a merchant marine vessel oh, cool. uh, when the Iraq War started in 2003. Wow. He was in charge of security. The Marines were already deployed, and normally they would be protected. The, 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 the ship was um, uh, bringing heavy equipment and things like that yeah, yeah. over there to ba- Basra, I think it was. And so he was in charge of that, and that's how he met Tracy. And um, I, I believe they went from playing canasta to you know how things happen sometimes. Uh, horizontal canasta, I think they call that other one. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, anyway, so one of the things we do, and if you're not an avid listener, you wouldn't know, but we, I do uh, one-word descriptions of either the kids or the grandkids. In this case, I know that there's at least three grandkids there. Four. Uh, four now. Would you like to um, name them each and give an age and then give a one-word description attempt without... Uh... Sure. So... 
my son Harlan and his and his spouse Tracy, they have three kids. Okay. Uh, the oldest is uh, 19, uh, Toby, Tobias. Okay. Uh, then the next one is Barbara, and she, um, I guess this July she'll be 17. And then the youngest is John, and they named him after me. His name is John Michael Kafalis. Nice. And what's really interesting and maybe a little bit bizarre is I was born the day after Christmas. Oh. He was born the day after oh, Christmas. how cool is that? So they have three kids. Uh, and then our younger son, Tim, yep. he works at CSU. <clears throat> and his spouse, Shana, works at Partners Mentoring Youth. Oh, great. And they have a five-year-old going on six, um, uh, granddaughter, well, our granddaughter, Mila. Mila. And M-I-L-A? Yeah. <laughs> What a pretty name. And she goes, she started full day kindergarten in August, and she um, she's at Harris Bilingual. Awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. So um, let's let's get those one word descriptions. I'll let you go oldest to youngest with Tobias first. Ah. <sighs> so one word, eh? One word. Sometimes we allow hyphens. If you allow hyphens, thank you. Risk taker. Ooh, sounds interesting. Tobias, you got a bright future ahead as long as you don't take too many risks. Um, but I'm sorry, I can't read my own writing here. Barbara. Barbara. Um, oh gosh. We can cut out some of this dead space if we need to. Oh, forgive me. I'll, I will say learner. Learner. I like that word. And then John. Video games. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, that's not exactly. Not yeah, close enough. And, uh, and then the other one, Mila. Yeah. Uh, curious. I'll leave it at that. Curious. Yeah, that'll, that'll benefit her probably more than risk taking in some ways. Um, let's hear a little bit more about Tim. Um, we, we heard about Harlan and his military journey. Tim's at CSU now, but he had a semi-famous ultimate Frisbee along the way. And, and what's he teaching or what's he doing? He worked. So Tim graduated from CSU, I think in two, th <coughs> excuse me, in 2008. And, um, he currently works in the, um, uh, the, the, academic success event csu academic oh, okay. success center and and um he when he was a student at csu he got into playing ultimate disc or ultimate frisbee and then when he graduated for five years he coached the csu team oh, wow. uh, the hibita team and he is actually made a name for himself because he currently uh coaches last year was the inaugural year of the semi-professional team in Colorado called the um, Colorado Summit. Okay. And he is one of the um, three coaches for the Colorado Summit. Oh, that's cool. And then he coaches. So they travel around for huge weekend <coughs> uh, yes. ultimate disc tournaments and whatever. Well, then actually in their inaugural year, they their record, they, it was um, – like 13 and one wow. and they actually made it to Madison, Wisconsin wow. in the semifinals and they almost made it to the championship game. But then he coaches another team. It's, it's called Johnny Bravo and it's an, another um, elite men's uh, wow. ultimate team. And they actually made national champions. Wow. What a distinctive uh, career journey. He might not be, no, no, don't tell CSU, but it wouldn't surprise me if his other opportunities outgrow his, main hustle one well, of these days and, and i think he you know he's very um <coughs> his work is is really meaningful and and yeah. i know recently they were um <clears throat> successful in getting a i think it's like a one and a half million dollar grant uh to uh, uh, promote um uh people of color diversity people pursuing phds for example oh. so that that's an example of the oh, kind wow. of work well that's a lot yeah, of they, impact they, too they, so. yeah they do a lot of great work and then his spouse Shana, she works for Partners Mentoring Youth, and yeah. and together they're just pretty amazing parents, <laughs> community, and, citizens, community yeah. citizens for sure. Yes. Um, let's talk about Beth a little bit, uh, it, because her dad was a Lutheran pastor in your neighborhood, nearly or not too far. Uh, is that uh, what's what's her family's ethnic heritage? Are they German? Um, yeah. I think there's a you know a number of yeah, things in there. But European mix, Northern yeah, European mix. I yeah, think this is what a yeah. lot of us are in North Dakota too. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so, what was it like? You told me that you were a little bit awkward and things. What was it 
maybe about you that that really drew her to you when you reconnected? Well, we had we had known each other before. Um, she often talks about how uh, during the Vietnam War there was a, a, a march, uh, and, and I was in high school at the time. Mm. And she comments that she saw me from a distance, kind of singing out, singing my lungs out, singing out my, yeah. my heart, and and then we did meet a little bit prior, and um, uh, but I just didn't pick up on the on yeah. the on the connections there. Uh, well, that I, was something that in, inspired her, at least impressed her, that you had, I guess, the boldness to the, go be part of that yes. and, and speak your mind. Yeah, and, and I think um, ultimately we knew each other. Um, you know, we, we started seeing each other when I went back east. And yeah. and um, I, I just think things, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a synergy there. And, yeah, yeah. and ultimately, and we've been married 41 years. Congratulations. Um, in no, November 21st. And... As you know, in relationships, they're not always a cakewalk, and sure. and there have been a few ups and downs. But I mean, overall, we've done well. And you know, after about forty years, you're, you're sort of on automatic. You get pretty comfortable, yeah. Automatic pilot. <laughs> but she um she has a degree from CSU, a music degree. She's she plays piano, other kinds of instruments, uh, and she worked at Redeemer Lutheran for nineteen years yeah, yeah. and retired. And now she is or was, and now less so, but the the primary. Um, child care person for Mila, oh. um, you know, ever since she was born, yeah. uh, Beth has been the main person, you know, yeah. taking care of her. And then as she got older, it was, you know, it was less days because she would go into a play group. And now, of course, with a um, full day kindergarten, Beth picks her up um, uh, three days a week from Harris. Yeah. And then the folks, the parents pick her up the other two oh, what days. A, I mean, what a blessing for oh. her. What a blessing for Mila. And what a blessing for for Mila's parents too, right? For Tim and and Shana. Absolutely, it's, yes. And and uh, you know, for for the longest time, I mean, Beth was um, earning some income that way, but it was much less, <laughs> right. as you can imagine, yeah. than if they were to have a, to go to. Um, sure. Well, daycare is you know twelve, fourteen hundred dollars a month, pretty much anymore, yeah. or fifteen hundred more. Yep, yep. And that's another issue that we're, you know, where the county has a role. We're trying to. You know, help address that issue, but yes. So Beth has been the main caretaker for Mila for the last number of years. Uh, she's um, another, you know, really smart person, and um, she's put up with me for forty-one years. <laughs> I, and and she's been very um, patient and tolerant because I, you know, I, I I work a lot. Yeah, yeah. And 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 that gets old sometimes, to be honest. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, but you know, recently, um, you know, we we went out on a, a date like twice in one weekend, which really is what? unheard of. <laughs> and in fact, t- t- tonight we may go to that pizzeria that I was mentioning. Oh, good. To support our friend uh, Mary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's a good relationship. Uh, I like to travel. She doesn't like to travel as much. We kind of yeah. have to work through that. Back in the day, we used to do a lot of hiking and camping and backpacking. She does less of that, but we still, you know, one really exciting thing that's coming up that. Um, was uh, my my birthday present from Mila and her folks was family trip 3.0 and I think you would appreciate this but over spring break my son has arranged everything Tim and we're going to fly to um I think Santa Cruz and camp out for four nights huh. in a, a cool. redwood uh, park there uh, a county park that has um um uh, coastal uh, redwood yeah, trees yeah. and maybe even go to uh What's that famous aquarium, Monterey Bay or something? Yep, yep. You know, do things something. like that. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, fill in, check off some of those boxes and places to see that you sacrificed as, as a public servant in the last 20 years and in a over full time job almost. Yeah. Over full time, part time job. <laughs> so I think that you've really shown a lot of love and appreciation for family through this conversation all along the way. And so uh, anything you'd like to say about your your Parents, I know your dad is dispatched. I assume your maybe your mom is. She's gone too. Gone uh, too by she, now. She um, well, I, I appreciate that, and and uh, you know, my my father was a great role model. Um, and it, it's weird when I think about him because he sacrificed a lot. He didn't have much of an education. Mm. He he worked his tail off in the diners, so you know we could we could have a some semblance of a comfortable life. We were never. You know, a regular middle class folks, maybe yeah. lower middle class. Uh, my mother was mostly um, a housekeeper or um, a homemaker, although she did work outside the the house, the home, especially in the years when my father uh, was not able to do that. Right, uh, right. It was harder. 
um, a, a, a lot of, um, you know, my, my Greek heritage is, is really important to me, the Greek traditions. Uh, you know, one of the things you brought up was about faith, and I, I think it's important and appropriate to share that um, I, I was baptized Greek Orthodox. Yeah, I wanted to get into that a little bit here, and, too, and, so and, let's just shift into the well, faith and, conversation. Well, and, and again, we, we were But then you married a, 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 a Lutheran, Lutheran girl. Yeah, and, and you know, we, we our wedding was one of those eclectic weddings. It wasn't in a Greek Orthodox church, uh, but it all, and, and my mother, you know, my father was in the hospital at the time. We didn't think enough mm. to ask him to try to get him out. He was dealing with prostate cancer and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, my mother actually did show up, although she was late. I think it was hard for her because uh, it was in my, you know, I'm sorry, forgive <laughs> okay. me. It was in... Um, Here, you need that whiskey in your hand. Too. No, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> All right. It was in, uh, in, in Beth's dad's, his, the Bethlehem Lutheran Church. But it was, it was a great thing. And, and again, my father, I, 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 sometimes I, I go to tears when I think of him because he worked so yeah. hard. And he was a very giving person, and I think he was a great role model. And I didn't see him much because he worked a lot of the times. Yeah, yeah. And then my mother... You know, again, she did the best she could to love us. She was actually um, part of, um, you know, when the Nazis occupied Greece, she was there as a teenager, and it was really hard. Oh, wow. It was really, really hard. I mean, they had to hide in cemeteries. They didn't have much to eat. And I think she comes, uh, I think you can relate, Kirk, that, the, the, the ge- that generation, the greatest generation, I mean, there were a lot of issues there that we haven't had to yeah, deal with. Yeah, yeah. And so she... She had carried some trauma from those times, I, I, even. I, in some I would ways. say yes, and I guess the thing, as much as I love my mom, it wasn't easy, because even though I did well in school and all of that, it was never good enough. Yeah. And I think she imparted that on my my dad too, um, and so that was a little bit hard. But over time, you know, she came to love Beth and Harlan and everything else. Yeah. So I think that was really helpful, and and we had a good relationship, and then. Five years ago or so, she um, she got sick, and you know she, yeah. you know she eventually passed away. This was back in New York, and I was glad because I was it was Mother's Day, and uh, I was um, with Beth, and we were at the Hilton here, you know, on, on Prospect, mm-hmm. and we were we took a, a friend of ours, Mary, who was um, uh, a mom, a grandma, uh, we took her out, you know, for brunch, Mother's Day brunch, and I remember getting a call and. You know, if you're from New York, they like to use four-letter words quite a bit. Sure. Um, and they said, you need to get here right away. Um, you know, mom's in the hospital and she's not doing well. So I got it. I got there the next morning. My sister flew in from Athens. And ultimately, we got to spend the last 48 hours. But in the end, um, we had to make a decision about... Um, yeah. Yeah. So it goes. Yeah. Um, so have you remained Greek Orthodox or do you go to the Lutheran church? And cause I, I, I confess actually, I have a little bit of knowledge about Greek Orthodoxy because I, I met a former member of a church that I knew that, that, uh, owns a gym down in Loveland and he had switched from be, like being like raised an evangelical to the Greek Orthodox church. Uh, and I've listened to the podcast from their church, the St. St. Spiegel's or St. Something in Loveland. In, in, on 29th Street, St. Spiridon. Yeah, St. Spiridon, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, but I've really enjoyed, frankly, the, I guess, kind of part of the tradition. Like, they kind of largely do services the same as they did 2,000 years ago and followed a lot of the same protocol. And really the consistency, you know, and, and really, uh, and, and the perspective of God and how, uh, how you can't really define uh, that force as well as maybe we want to try to we put I would like to say we put all of our various you know Baptists and event you know Methodists and stuff we're putting God in little boxes and the Greeks kind of refused to put God in a box in comparison that's that's interesting all of what you've just said and uh, so I was raised Greek Orthodox it still is important to me I kind of stepped away from it you know part of it is as you said they do the um, uh, the liturgy and the service in, in the ancient the old Greek and if you didn't know that, it was hard, and, you know, how do you relate to that? So that was part of, um, you know, I would go to church when I was a kid because you had to go to church. Uh, but, I, you know, I would also, I also went to Greek school, like they, you know, where I had sure. to le- learn Greek um, and all of that. But but my Christian faith has always been really important. And talk about journeys. So when I came back, uh, when I came back from Peace Corps and I saw, like, Christian-based communities and how people who were dealing with immense poverty and a lot of violence and all that were overcoming that. I mean, it was just an amazing thing, Kurt. 
I, I realized that there's a lot of strength there. And, and so I migrated to um, some of the historic peace churches. Mm. And when I came back to Fort Collins for a number of years, I attended the uh, Friends meeting here in town. Okay. And, and, um, and then from there, I actually... Um, attended the Mennonite Fellowship for... Oh. I, I never, you know, sort of converted or whatever. Yeah. But I was a member... Well, they're a consistent yeah. voice for peace. And, yeah. And, you know, thinking about not just your mom, but also your wife's first first husband, or whatever, first the, the father of Harlan. You know, people get wrecked by war, and the deciders about getting into war don't always seem to think about that consequence. And... Once again, I appreciate your insights. Um, yeah, I, you know, the people who go off to war, the soldiers like my son or like uh, all the sacrifices that families and soldiers are experiencing now yeah. in, in Ukraine with the the war with Russia. Sure. Um, that's real and that's that's something that we have to honor and, and support. Uh, it's oftentimes the politicians who make decisions about getting us into war, yeah. and I'm not sure if they've actually... They don't face any consequences, They don't hardly. face any consequences. I don't know how much they've thought through it, what the implications are. So I've never been a big... Um, you know, I've always considered myself as a, quote, nonviolent activist. You know, there's a term, a pacifist, yeah. and I still consider myself that, but I think one of the things that I've... Um, and even with my idealism, I, I still consider myself an idealist, which is very different, and we can get into that if you'd like... Uh, an ideologue um, versus someone who is a, quote, idealist. Mm -hmm. And I believe in, that as I've gotten older, I'm more of a sort of pragmatic <laughs> Yeah, I was, just, I was thinking idealist. of that exact phrase, a pragmatic idealist <laughs> well, is like the right combination. You, you, you and I could have a good cup of coffee sometime, but um, no, that's, that's where I've, that's been part of my evolution as a, as a human being. Yeah. Um, and, and I still, I realize that, you know, like my pacifism is really, challenged and and uh right. we live in a very imperfect world and like what's happening right now it has been happening for almost a year in ukraine um it, it's hard to understand or or fathom you know what could be an effective you know non-violent response non-war right, right so so that's been a real challenge but ultimately <laughs> what has guided me honestly uh kurt this is really important that my christian faith you know the um, the beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, of things that I, I, um, I, I radiate towards. That's been really, really important to me, and, it, and it's helped guide. You know, you hear a lot about the Golden Rule and all that stuff, but it, it's helped guide how I try to be with people, and and how I try to be honest. Um, you know, maybe I've told a few white lies over the years. Yeah. Uh, but my faith is important. If it's only a few, you're doing better than most. <laughs> uh, but I also don't like to wear it on my sleeve. You know, yeah. my my Christian faith. Yeah, I think that's fair because a lot of people hear that you're a Christian and they've been hurt by a Christian or, you know, feeling like they've been uh, judged by a Christian or, or things. I like to say I part of the reason I'm a Christian is because I need more grace than the average person <laughs> because I have more terrible thoughts and all those things, perhaps. I don't know. Um, one more question. Uh most people don't know this, or quite a few people do, but I was five foot one until the end of my sophomore year in high school. So and then I got a massive growth spurt and turned into this tall guy. But how tall are you, John? You must be only about that tall too, five three or four or something. Darn, I missed the growth spurt. <laughs> <laughs> um, to your question, uh, I believe I'm five three. At least that's what my driver's license says. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, as you get older, sometimes that changes. But five three, I think, is fair. I mean, that's what I when I have a physical exam, I that, that's where you measure in. Yeah. Well, you've got almost because you little guys don't ever get this, but <laughs> tall guys, especially tall, skinny, wimpy guys, have experienced little man syndrome a lot or Napoleon syndrome. You are almost completely absence of that uh, heavily pre prevalent uh, disease among short guys. <laughs> so know, compliments to you on well, that. Well, I, I appreciate that, and again, I. Want to be cautious. It's, this is not necessarily a therapy session, uh, but I, I once again, to be honest, um, you know, being small, maybe looking a little bit different, um, and that gets back to maybe the relationship thing. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, mm. I, there's always been a le- I'll be honest. There's always been a level of insecurity. Yeah. And and I've had to overcome that. And I think overall I have. And when people say, you know, if you're going to be an elected official or a politician, you got to be a, a mega extrovert. On the Myers Briggs, I'm actually right on the line between I and E. Hmm. And and um, I typically am kind of on the introvert side. But once I get going, then it's easier. But yeah. I, you know, you go to the parties or this and that. It, it's hard for me to, I have to break through before I can really start yeah. engaging. Yeah. No, I feel you. And frankly, Gosh. that being that, I, I was Kurt the Squirt. I was four foot 11 when I got to seventh grade and I was five foot one at the end of my 10th grade. And so for four years, I basically didn't grow when everybody else was getting big. And I carried that, you know, even after I got to be that strapping six to 130 pound college freshman, I still, I was so scared uh, of approaching a girl or anything like that. And so I can appreciate that sentiment, how it takes a while. And, and in your case, you didn't have that growth spurt. So, no, I, yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting approaching a girl and, and, and that's my orientation, of course. And yeah. Yeah. I remember growing up, you know, I, I always had a lot of good friends. I mean, people felt like a safe space with me. Yeah. And oftentimes, you know, the quote, the girls would let me hang out with them and they'd <laughs> share all this stuff with me. I'm like, why, you know, but it would really, it was, it was really hard because, um, yeah, yeah. because they would be say, well, this is how I feel about this person. And then I really didn't have the the security or the courage to say, well, by the way, I actually... I think you're swell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if there's somebody out there that's listening and they, like, you've, you've kind of achieved moving past it, um, and maybe that's just the time of experience, but is there any words you'd have for somebody that just is feeling awkward about that time in their space or they're just whether they're they don't have to be short they don't have to be tall because everybody just about feels awkward about themselves i i think it's important you know you hear a lot about this but i just think that folks you know how, how you grow up and i mean those of us who have been in loving families are at, a, at an advantage mm. you know if if like mila with her two parents yeah. this kid is like mega loved and that helps to strengthen, you know, what your image of yourself. So I think it's really important to try to love yourself as much as possible, and and to you know to affirm who you are. And I think that is really critical, mm. you know, a, a, in terms of interacting with other people, whether it's for friendships, platonic, yeah. or or perhaps more than that. Well, I think that's frankly one of the advantages of having faith in your life, is that it's so reinforced that God loves me, and if God, with all of his powers and capabilities and strength and whatever loves me, then maybe I should too. Well, and then the as- another aspect of that, I, I suppose, is, um, you know, this whole idea of forgiveness and redemption. Sure. Uh, um, I, I think it's important to be able to forgive and, and to recognize that you also can be forgiven because we don't always yeah. get it right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the culture is shifting a little bit to... You know, when when ten year old videos are dug out and and used as a reason to cancel somebody or things like that, it's a really interesting place, right? Um, because grace doesn't have the same kind of place in the non believer as, as we tie to. And, and, and I guess one other point I'll make perhaps is that um, I think that the the human spirit is incredibly uh, strong and resilient, unless Agreed. it's been you know unless it's been crushed and. You know, there's all kinds of ways that we can yeah. be hurt and, and, and traumatized. Well, we can so respond to it in different ways. We can respond to it in different ways. Uh, but I think ultimately the, you know, the human spirit is really powerful and resilient. And um, it helps us to overcome adversity. Yeah, yeah. Because adversity is part of life. That's uh, that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, except for bears, they'll kill you. I have a good grizzly bear story. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's time. Uh, let's move on to the loco experience. So this is the crazy story from your lifetime. You set that up, huh? Uh, you know, not intentionally, but uh, I, I flow with my words pretty solid. Uh, let's hear it. Let's. Uh... Yeah, I'll try to give you the, goodness gracious, I'll try to give you the Cliff Notes version. But um, So I graduated from CSU in May of 78, I suppose. Okay. And actually, I started working for um, 
we helped start recycling in, in Fort Collins with Kelly Olson. Of oh, all really? People. Oh, that's cool. I don't know if you remember, recycle something, and a, a lot of interesting memories about the original recycling center, which was right there. Yeah, uh, no, I wasn't around it, was it yet. It was right there by Northside Ozatlan. But all that said, I decided um, I wanted to, I needed to take an adventure. So I, in August of, of 78, I got my backpack, and back then it was an external frame. Right. And... Um, I uh, hitchhiked to Fairbanks, Alaska. Okay. And I remember, uh, I remember someone dropping me off at the intersection in Laporte and Overland Trail there. Okay. And I had a little cardboard sign that said Fairbanks, Alaska, <laughs> and I had my pack. <laughs> and cars would drive by, and they were like, no. "Well, that's the right highway." I mean, two eighty seven goes up there a long way. But right? I had a marker, and I realized, okay, a little bit at a time. So I actually put Laramie, Wyoming, and I actually made great progress. It took me 10 days, but I made it to Fairbanks. I had some friends there, and the friend that I was visiting with, it was actually one of the reasons we, uh, that my uh, my wife, you know, went to Alaska, and they didn't, they didn't, they weren't together for very long. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but that was part of the connection there. That was part of the connection. So I went to Fairbanks, and um, my friend uh, who who wrote a you might relate to this a Norton we were into British uh, oh, uh, yeah. cars and 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 motorcycles yeah. Triumphs and Nortons he apparently got in a big accident he was all in a cast so he couldn't hike mm. so I I wanted to hike Denali Park and um, I'd planned this week long trip I was going to go solo and the um, I, I I got I hitchhiked to Fairbanks I took the bus all the way into you know where I was going to put in. And I remember hiking uh, on the tundra there about three miles in and set up camp. Uh, but that night was amazing because I was all by myself um, yeah. on the tundra. Northern lights rocking out. The north, gosh, the northern. I, I got the whole. I got the triple. Uh, the northern lights rocking out. Then at some point, the the a full moon came up, and Denali, you could see it because it wasn't. Oh, wow. It wasn't. Cu- so that was an amazing evening. Next morning, I um. I had a big pack because it was like a 60-pound pack and going back to the <laughs> five-foot-three thing. It took me a while to get that pack on. Broke camp, had breakfast, broke camp, was getting ready to put my pack on, and I see this grizzly bear mm. uh, charging towards me, and I thought to myself, that's not good. Right. So um, long story short, I, I set the pack down. I backed away. I got down on the ground. I sort of played dead. Although I had my camera, and I tried to take a couple of pictures, but that didn't work so out. So he wasn't charging you specifically. He was just curious, kind he was of curious, running but, upon you. Almost. But I think I think I had some things in my pack that p- put out a scent. Like mm. I, you know, you're not really supposed to bring any fresh food. I might have had some carrots or scallions. That's a good one. <laughs> right. Um, so in the end, he wound up going for the pack. He tore it apart. Wow. Um, I was there kind of stuck there for at least an hour or so i would um he would uh, stop and go by the stream kind of lie down take a nap i'd get up and move and eventually i was able to get away but uh, that was my pack behind uh, it was it was demolished and then (laughs) i made it back to the road and told the rangers they went back down there well first they said to me well you should have just thrown a rock some rocks at him i might have caused him you know to to go the other way and (laughs) i like it's a big bear (laughs) a big bear yes and i said to them well that's easier for you to say because you guys went down there to look at what happened and you had a tranquilizer guns, for right. example. Right, and a backup high-power uh, rifle. Right. So in the end, the bear was there. Bear went off. It was a, it was an area. They had different areas that they, the way they did their backpacking, you know, they, um, the, the backcountry permits and all of that. Hmm. And it was an area where there had been a lot of encounters between humans and bears. Yeah. And and they picked up the pieces of my uh, of my pack. And, and uh, needless to say, my trip was... Um, my one week backpack trip was cut short. <laughs> right. So I had to hitchhike back with a duffel bag. Well, I appreciate you taking time to, to spend with this bear uh on our podcast today. And uh oh that's that's part of my, my crazy heritage, by the way. because um, I was born in August of seventy four and seventy four is the year of the tiger. August is the month of Leo, and so I'm lion and tiger and bear by that's birth. Great. That's great. <laughs> I, I can see that in you. John, um, is there any last words of wisdom out there? Or if somebody wants to find you, can they just like email you or something like that at the county? Or? Sure. Um, I'm not sure if I have any additional words of wisdom, if I have any words of wisdom. I just want to say that I actually have enjoyed this a lot. Good. And I really appreciate you rethinking of me. Um, 
And I hope there's some value to our conversation to other folks who might listen. So thank you very much for this experience. Pleasure. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, if folks want to contact me uh, for county business, you know, my email is jcafalis at larimer.org. My cell phone number is public, 720-254-7598. And if it's for personal political stuff, as long as Fry is still with us, Front Range Internet, oh, right. uh, I have John K1 at fry.com is the, okay. what I use for you know things that, that are not county business because awesome. I separate it out. Well, I've enjoyed this very much as well, and um, I would be happy to spend another two hours with you. Uh, and we might not do it on a podcast over coffee instead. So know that I, I look forward to that opportunity too. That would be great. And perhaps if you get fabulous reviews on this podcast, who knows, maybe yeah. in a year or two, you might want to have me oh, back. Oh, I would have you back for sure, for <laughs> sure. Uh, but, but we probably will wait for at least a year because that's the way we do things around here. But uh, yeah, share it with all your friends. I know you got a lot more friends than I do probably after 20 years of service plus. Yeah, that's a... Uh, that's, I run into a lot of folks, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. It's been a joy. And uh, sincerely appreciate all your service and, and your time here today. Thank you, Kurt. Godspeed. Thank you for listening to this episode. This is Alma Ferrer, producer of the Loco Experience podcast. If you enjoyed this program and would like to support the show, please share it with your favorite people and leave us a review. To see upcoming guests, behind-the-scenes footage, and more, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at The Loco Experience. Subscribe to never miss the latest interview, and until next time, stay loco.